Chapter One of the Mary Frances Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter One The Kitchen People. All the kitchen people were terribly excited. I see my finish puffed tea kettle from his perch on the stove that slang snapped saucepan who sat nearby slang or no slang said tea kettle i'll melt if somebody doesn't come fill me soon where's the cook where's the mistress asked boiler pan why the cook's left left this morning and the mistress is sick what's that i smell burning that's the potatoes in the oven said toaster oh my lid cried tea kettle holding his nose pour on water quick whew exclaimed coffee pot whew cried pie plate whew clanged big iron pot whew mimicked saucepan whew that won't help if you say whew to an oven door will it open somebody open the door good idea saucy exclaimed tea kettle you might try it yourself oh oh strained little saucepan at the heavy door oh i can't budge it gosh oh ush he coughed what smoke somebody else come try get out of the way then said big iron pot making heavily toward the stove knew your arms were too short laughed tea kettle seeing iron pot couldn't reach the knob well they're as long as yours said iron pot angrily kick it open suggested saucepan everybody allowed one kick first go exclaimed iron pot whack came a muffled sound then oh my poor feet oh oh what's the matter cried saucepan nothing said big iron pot hopping around on one little leg and holding the other with his hands only i wish you'd had first go well declared tea kettle unless help comes soon we may as well give up all hope of rescue this is dreadful listen then ticked mantel clock who didn't mind the smoke i know a secret the dear little girl oh yes we know cried the kitchen people well asked mantel clock what do you know the little girl that there is a little girl is that all you know demanded mantel clock now when people interrupt just dying to tell said saucepan in a loud whisper please please tell us a secret begged the kitchen people well mantel clock ran on the dear little girl that lives in our house is going to learn to cook what do you say if we all turn in and help her goody goody auntie rolling pin laughed so she nearly rolled off the table just then the kitchen doorknob turned and every one of the kitchen people was as quiet as a mouse end of chapter one chapter two of the mary frances cookbook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 2 Toaster Man. In ran the dearest, sweetest little girl. Oh, you poor tea kettle, she cried. You'll boil to death. And she pulled it over to the cooler part of the stove. Tea kettle simmered his thanks what can be burning she asked what can it be 
and she looked all over the stove. I do believe it's something in the oven. As she pulled open the oven door, out rolled the burnt potatoes. Now, she said, now for the toast. And she caught up her mother's apron from the hook and tied it just under her arms, crossing the strings in front. The kitchen people held their breath to see what would happen next. Suddenly she clapped her hands. The very thing, she cried, and ran out of the room. In a minute she was back with a little book in her hands. Mother was asleep, she whispered, as though her mother was still in danger of being wakened by any sound. But I just tiptoed up to the table and got the book she's been making for my cooking lessons. This must be it. It's mother's writing. The Mary Frances First Cookbook. I believe, I just believe it tells about toast. Yes, here it is, right on the first page. Number one plain toast one cut stale bread into slices about half an inch thick two remove crusts three put into wire toaster four hold over a fire moving to and fro until a golden brown color five turn and brown the other side Let's see if there is any stale bread. I should think so, a whole loaf. Now I'll cut two slices, and since I want it to be very nice, I'll cut off the crusts. I guess that will be enough. Oh, how I wish somebody was here to help me. There is somebody. I'll help. Mary Frances looked round in amazement, seeing no one. Why? Where? Why? Who? are you she asked i'm tea kettle miss said tea kettle lifting his lid very politely i'm gladly at your service if you please and i it was saucepan and i cried boiler pan mary frances could scarcely believe her ears my she said can you all talk and will you help me isn't that grand but how you did surprise me won't we have a lovely time look at the fire look at the fire what a tiny voice thought the little girl but she quickly took the lids off the stove some very bright coals stared up at her the fire is fine she said aloud and she looked all about to find where the voice came from but she saw no one Look down, please, said the same tiny voice, this time very distinctly. There stood the funniest little wire man, no higher than the little girl's elbow. You didn't see me, laughed the little man, but I know how to make toast. Of course, said the little girl. You're, why, you're the toaster. Yes, ma'am, said the little man with a bow at your service miss mary frances try me and see what i can do went on toaster man just put a slice of that bread into my head and hold me over the fire mary frances leaned over and gravely put a slice of bread in toaster he looked so funny standing there that she wanted to smile but thought it wouldn't be exactly polite to so helpful a friend but when he said, slide up my collar, in a thick, smothery sort of voice, she laughed aloud before she could stop, but turned the sound into a cough so quickly that Toaster Man looked up at her queerly only a moment, and she pulled the ring up until it held the bread tightly in place. Now, lift me up over the fire, he demanded. Mary Frances hesitated. She couldn't tell where to take hold of him. Never mind my legs, he said, as though he read her thoughts. I'll see to them. And he folded them so close that when Mary Frances lifted him up, she could find no sign of them. Oh, but you'll be burnt, she cried, 
as she held what toaster man had called his head over the bright fire not i he laughed not i i like it it's the toast that'll be burnt if i'm not turned over soon mary frances took the hint and turned toaster carefully over not too close to the coals at first little miss said the little fellow now closer that's it how is it he asked as mary frances took him from the fire what a beautiful piece of toast she cried grandificent exclaimed toaster now you do the next piece without my saying a word but first spread that with butter and put it in the oven now you read in your book and see if that's not the way to make buttered toast mary frances opened her book read it out said the little man when i speak that way mother tells me to say please said she beg pardon said the little man please so mary frances read number two buttered toast one spread toasted bread evenly with butter two pile one slice on top of the other and cover with a bowl three place in oven that's it that's what i told you cried the little fellow i'm always right about toast can you make the next slice without a word more i think so said mary frances and she didn't utter a sound until she had taken the second piece out of toaster what a beautiful piece of toast exclaimed toaster it's better than the first oh i don't think mary frances started i know snapped the little man don't contradict me about toast by the way why don't you make it into milk toast for your mother it will be softer and more palate palate palatable said mary frances yes said he you know a good deal for a little girl and he began to choke mary frances patted him hard a piece of toast she asked no he exclaimed indignantly a long word always makes me choke but that's why i seldom use them now please read about milk toast if you know suggested mary frances well it's more like real grown-up people to have it out of a book said the little man go on and mary frances read from her little cookbook number three milk toast one tablespoon butter one tablespoon flour one cup milk quarter teaspoon salt three slices toast one make ready the toast two heat the milk until smoking hot three melt the butter in a small saucepan four throw the flour into the butter cook until it bubbles a little stirring all the time take from the fire five pour one-third the milk upon the butter and flour a little at a time stirring with the back of a spoon to press out the lumps six place over fire and gradually stir in the remaining milk seven add the salt let boil a minute eight put slices of toast in a heated dish pour the sauce over and serve hot all measures are made level with the top of cup or spoon to measure level spoonful fill spoon heaping full and level it off with the back of a knife for half spoonful cut through lengthwise for quarter spoonful divide a half spoonful across a salt spoon is one eighth teaspoon that's right said toaster man that's the way my grandmother made it if i were you i'd make only half of that sauce for only two slices of toast you did so well with the plain toast you go right ahead with the milk toast and see if you can make it all yourself and if you need any help i'll be on the spot in a twinkle follow carefully what your little cookbook says you know you must measure everything even with the top of the spoon or cup so mary frances did exactly what the recipe told her as she poured the last of the sauce over the toast which she had put in a pretty dish 
the little man who had been running here and there watching everything she did shouted hurrah at least he tried to shout but his voice would scarcely reach to a grown-up person's ear you are the best pupil i ever had have you had many asked mary frances you were the only one said toaster why nothing said mary frances i should think said the little man standing on his toes to look over the edge of the dish that that milk toast would taste awful good won't you try it asked mary frances she was very much afraid he would but she wanted to show her gratitude for his kindness oh no sighed the little man i never eat you never eat exclaimed mary frances it may seem strange to you said the little man but everything that is put into my head falls out backwards and i simply can't eat it must be dreadful said mary frances it keeps me very thin complained toaster but if i'm not mistaken your mother will eat all that toast if she gets it while it's hot oh i hope so said mary frances and i thank you so very much Goodbye, added the little girl as she went out of the kitchen followed by the admiring gaze of all the kitchen people end of chapter two chapter three of the mary frances cookbook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Wolf. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 3 Mary Frances's Mother. Mary Frances pushed open the door of her mother's room very softly. What has my little girl there? asked her mother. Oh, are you awake, mother? It's a surprise for you and she carried the tray over to the bed. Her mother carefully lifted the lid of the dish. Milk toast! The only thing I could eat! Why, who made it? If it hadn't been for toaster, it couldn't have been made, said Mary Frances. Her mother looked at the girl in surprise. I mean, she added, that toaster really did it. He showed me how. Oh, laughed her mother, as she lifted a slice of toast out on a saucer. Well, dear, anyway, I want you to have some toast with mother. And she handed the saucer to Mary Frances, who said she would much rather watch her mother eat it than to have some herself. But after her first taste, she found how hungry she was. It's the best toast I ever ate, said her mother. And Mary Frances, dear, I feel much better already. She would have said more had not Mary Frances's brother bounded up the stairs two steps at a time with, What do you think? I met Father downtown, and he says Aunt Maria's coming over to keep house for us. In the daytime she must be at home, but she'll come over to get breakfast for us, and we'll go there for our dinners. And Father says Mother is going to the seashore to have a perfect rest until she's well. Anyhow, I'm glad we won't starve. I wish Sis knew how to cook. And he teasingly pulled one of Mary Frances's curls. Hush, brother, said the mother. You should have been here to see the lovely milk toast sister just brought me. It was the best I ever ate, and she made it all herself. Almost, said Mary Frances. Oh, yes, said her mother. The dear little girly wants Toaster to get part of the praise. Ha ha! laughed the brother, and Mary Frances somehow couldn't explain about the kitchen folks. Instead, when does Aunt Maria come? she asked. Does she come tonight? She's coming right over, answered her brother. Oh, oh, thought Mary Frances. I must warn the kitchen people. Brother, she began nervously, you stay with mother. I want to take these things down. But brother was already sitting quietly near mother, and Mary Frances hurried softly downstairs. The poor dears, 
the poor dears, she kept whispering all the way down. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Mary Frances Cookbook」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Indu Nair The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer Chapter Four Mary Frances wants the kitchen folks. To the kitchen door she ran and was about to rush out when she thought she heard voices. Thin little voices they were, so she peeped out for the door was ajar. And this is what she saw Toaster Man, all tired out, was leaning back in a chair, snoring softly. But all the other kitchen people were wide awake. It was Tea Kettle that was speaking. So he put the eight feathers in a pan and cooked them. Who did? asked Saucepan. The Jackrabbit. And then he ate their fringe all off and gave the bones to the cat. Then he bragged. He bragged that he'd eaten eight whole chickens at once. Is that all? asked Saucepan. Yes, said Tea Kettle. Huh, said Saucepan. Was that his recipe for fried chicken? My, I'd love to hear more about Jack Rabbit, thought Mary Frances, but I must warn them about Aunt Maria. And she hurried out into the kitchen. Listen, she whispered with upraised finger. Listen, mother is going away, and Aunt Maria is coming over to keep house. Don't ever say a word. She'll never understand you, and she'll scrub and score you till you ache, poor things. She'll do that anyway, but don't talk before her. I hurried down to warn you. I was so afraid you might. Never fear, spoke up Tea Kettle. We never, never talk before grown ups. We can't help them. I forgot to tell you. If you speak about us to anyone, we can never, never speak again. Oh, said Mary Frances, it's a secret. I'm so glad you told me. I came so near telling Mother about Toaster Man. I might have only. Then the doorbell rang. End of chapter 4. Chapter 5 of the Mary Frances Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer Chapter 5 Aunt Maria For the land's sakes, cried Aunt Maria. For the land's sakes, where in the world has that child been? Look at those hands. Have you been playing in the coal? I put coal on the fire said Mary Frances. I guess I'll take a look at that fire myself, Aunt Maria continued, as she started toward the kitchen. Just then, she caught sight of the tray which Mary Frances had brought downstairs. Milk toast, she sniffed. Who sent that in? I, I made it, Mary Frances began. There was one tiny piece left. Aunt Maria looked at it hard. It's wonderful, she said. Wonderful. Who showed you how? She demanded as Mary Frances stood silent. N nobody, 
at least no real person i read about how to make it in my cookbook your cookbook you mean your mother's cookbook no said mary frances i mean my cookbook mother's been making for me i'll show it to you and she ran to get it see it's mother's writing mary frances's first cookbook well said aunt maria you may turn out of some account after all it's about time to call for a reformation yes ma'am said mary frances not understanding the big word do you want me to call for it now don't be saucy snapped the old lady then she set about washing the little girl's hands and face rubbing so hard that it made the tears come finishing off with the towel until mary frances felt her face shine wonder if she thinks i'm a stove she thought maybe she'll black me some day by mistake i don't believe she knows how old i am she treats me like a baby for all the world sometimes yet she thinks i ought to know more queer while aunt maria was busy getting dinner she ran up to her mother's room mother she asked aunt maria will be gone home most of the daytime while you're away won't she yes dear said mother you and brother are to go to her house to lunch mother dear begged mary frances can't i get lunch for brother and me i was going to tell you i read i found the recipe for the milk toast in my little cookbook you've been making for me i came up and found it while you were asleep i just know i can get our lunches please can't i try well dear said mother smiling i really believe you may i've just been thinking about the toast and what a woman my dear little girl is just then aunt maria called dinner end of chapter five chapter six of the mary frances cookbook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 6 Jacket Boiled Potatoes. Goodbye, Billy. Take care of sister. Goodbye, little housekeeper, said mother, leaning from the car window. The children waved goodbye and watched the train until it was a speck in the distance. "'I'm off to the mill race with the boys, sister. Catch!' cried Billy, tossing Mary Frances the key. "'All right,' she called. "'Be sure to come home to lunch. Twelve o'clock.' Mary Frances suddenly felt very lonesome. "'But I'll go home to my kitchen folks. They'll be good company,' she thought." When she let herself into the house, how big and empty it seemed. She was almost afraid to go in, but she bravely locked the door behind her. She thought she heard a noise. Surely the curtain moved. Her heart went pit-a-pat. The curtain moved again. Out sprang Juby, and scampered off into the kitchen. Oh, you darling kitten! she cried, running after her. How you scared me, Juby! Everything was neat as a pen. All the kitchen folks were in their place, prim and quiet and scared, just as Aunt Maria had left them. But when they saw her, 
they brightened up and smiled a welcome. "'How do you do, kitchen folks?' she said. "'How do, little miss?' merrily sang Tea Kettle. "'How do?' ticked Mantel Clock. "'What in the world shall I have for lunch?' mused the little girl. "'That boy will be as hungry as two bears, and I don't know many things to cook yet. Toast is all right for a sick person, but it isn't much for a hungry boy, and I ought to make something new. Let me see what my little book says.' And she fetched it out of its hiding place. "'Oh, I know. I'll make everything.' I do hope I get through the book before Mother comes back. Huh, let's see. Here's How to Cook Potatoes and Eggs. Here are biscuits, and even how to make tarts and cakes, and goody candy. Oh, how I'd love to make candy right away. But Mother said I should make things in the order they come in the book. So today I make... Number four. Jacket boiled potatoes. One. Scrub rather small potatoes well. Two. Pair a ring around each the long way. Drop into cold water. Three. Drain. Cover with boiling water. Add one tablespoon salt. Four. Let boil about thirty-five minutes or until a fork will easily pierce the largest. 5. Drain all the water, and set pan at back of stove to dry off the potatoes. 6. Serve in their jackets. I wonder how many Billy will eat, she thought, as she brought the basket. I guess about, about, I don't know, he has an enormous appetite. I guess I'll cook a hundred. He'll never eat a hundred. Mary Frances looked around. Boiler Pan was climbing down the closet shelf. Hello, how do you know? asked Mary Frances. You never saw him eat. Hear that, hear that, cried Boiler Pan. As though I hadn't cooked potatoes before you were born. Eat a hundred? Why, I can't hold a hundred. So there. Ho, oh, ho, said Mary Frances. That must be so. How many can you hold? Oh, about thirty, I guess, swelling with pride. Well, said Mary Frances, you've no notion how many that boy can eat and there isn't much else for lunch. I guess I'll cook about twelve. And counting them out, she began to wash them. Be sure to get all of the sand out of their eyes, <laughs> laughed Boiler Pan. But first, will you help me jump up to the stove and fill me? Then I can boil while you're wringing the potatoes. This done, he was very quiet while she finished the potatoes. Just then, the clock struck eleven. Why, I must hurry, exclaimed Mary Frances. I'm ready, bubbled Boiler Pan. Oh, yes, I'm coming. And she dropped the potatoes in, one by one. Now put on my hat, said Boiler Pan, and Mary Frances put on the lid. Are they all right? asked the little girl. All right, he answered in a muffled voice. Mary Frances then went into the dining room and busied herself about setting the table. Soon she heard a rumpus in the kitchen. She ran out. Bubbles were spurting over the sides of the boiler pan, and the lid was dancing a jig. What shall I do? What shall I do? cried Mary Frances, jumping up and down. This hat's crazy. Take it off quick, Boiler Pan besought her. Without thinking, she seized the lid with her fingers. 
but dropped it with a cry of pain. I'm scalded, I'm scalded, she sobbed. What will I do for it? And she ran for some cold water. Don't do that, child, said Auntie Rolling Pin. Butter it up, and then powder it with baking soda, the way your mother does. I'm so sorry, said Boiler Pan, but I couldn't get my old hat off. I should have told you to take a holder. Never mind, it's better now. These potatoes must be done. Yes, as she tried them with a fork. Even the biggest is done in the middle. I'm so glad, for I expect that boy any minute. So am I, said Boiler Pan, for I feel the effect of this strenuosity. Mary Frances pretended not to notice this speech, but carefully drained the water from the potatoes and shook Boiler Pan over the fire to dry them off. I... I learned that that wor word after year years of st study, he said between the shakes, and you nev never not noticed. But Billy was knocking, so Mary Frances, hastily putting boiler pan on the back of the stove, ran to let him in. Hello, sister. Here we are. Lunch ready? Yes, all ready. I'll put it on. You sit in father's place, and we'll play we're grown up. Scrumptious, exclaimed Billy, as Mary Frances set the smoking dish of potatoes on the table. What an excellent cook we must have, madam, he said, after his first taste. Such good potatoes. I have ten said Mary Frances. Ten! You are quite fortunate indeed, madam, said Billy, for all the world as though he were a grown-up young gentleman. How quiet they keep! Yes, laughed Mary Frances, but they're most always busy, and she held up her ten pink fingers. Oh, Billy, she added earnestly, I'm so glad you like them. The potatoes, I mean. There is only one left. Won't you have it? Oh, let's give that to Juby. Juby might be hurt if you didn't let her try them. I would if I were Juby. End of chapter 6《The Pot and Kettle Fight》of the Mary Frances Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Lawley. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 7. Good morning, kitchen people, said Mary Frances after breakfast next day. This is a very important morning with me. The kitchen people looked pleased and important, too. You see, it's this way, she continued, as she took her little book and sat in the rocking chair. I am very anxious to get through every recipe in my cookbook before Mother comes home, so I guess we'll just finish all the potato recipes today and give Billy a potato lunch. Won't that be fine? The kitchen people all smiled in approval. She went to the window. Oh, Billy! Billy! she called. You're invited to a potato lunch in our dining room at twelve o'clock. All right, I'll be on time, answered Billy from the garden. Let's see, said Mary Frances to herself. Four more recipes, about two potatoes each. Four times two, eight. She washed the potatoes carefully and had no sooner set about paring them than the kitchen door opened and in walked Aunt Maria. What in the world is that child doing? Paring potatoes? Did I ever? Such thing. 
close parings too. How well she does it. But you must drop them into cold water as soon as they are paired, child. I wish I could stay and show you how to cook, but duty calls me. I must be going. Mary Frances stepped to the door with her. When I was your age, child, I could cook most everything and piece patchwork for quilts. And she kept Mary Frances on the porch ten minutes, telling her that little girls weren't brought up any more to be useful the way that they were when she was a little girl. Oh, my lid, sang Tea Kettle, as Mary Frances stepped back into the kitchen. Oh, my aunt, as the old lady went, gone, said Big Iron Pot from the back of the stove. Who dares correct me, simmered Tea Kettle. I dare, spluttered Iron Pot, I dare, and I dare tell you other things too. You do, do you, bubbled Tea Kettle, you do? Well, what do you dare tell me? I dare tell you, mister, said Iron Pot, that you've got a dirty face. Yes, a black face. Tea Kettle, it was plain to be seen, was boiling mad. Steam blew out of his nose in every direction. Now, everybody who knows anything about a Tea Kettle can imagine how very angry Tea Kettle was. As soon as he could get his breath, he blew steam all over Iron Pot. My face is black, is it? Well, yours is black, and it will soon be black and blue. You swallow them words, and Iron Pot raised his queer little fists. Spat, mocked Tea Kettle, getting ready to spout again. Take that! Wang! came down the little fist, but not on the lid of Tea Kettle. Oh no, for just as that was going to happen, Mary Frances lifted him high in the air. Let go of me. Let me iron pot. He was at white heat. Be quiet, said Mary Frances, shaking him quite hard. What's all this about? Iron pot commenced it. Suddenly simmered tea kettle. Iron pot called me names. Why, said Mary Frances, this is disgraceful. Now, you sit there. She put Tea Kettle on the front of the stove. And you, there. She pulled Big Iron Pot as far back as she could. Now, behave yourselves. Then she sat down to rest. What makes them quarrel so, I wonder? Mary Frances said half to herself. All the kitchen people seem so kind and helpful. Why, don't you know, child? asked Auntie Rolling Pin. I thought everybody knew that story. A story? Mary Frances was always ready to listen to a story. Won't you tell me, please? Auntie Rolling Pin cleared her voice and rolled back an inch or two to a more comfortable place on the table. You see, it's this way, child, she began. In the days of your great-grandmother, there were no stoves. Only open fireplaces were used for cooking, and kettles were just as black then as that old black pot there. So, when the pot caught the kettle black, the kettle said, Black yourself, and no harm was done. But when your mother got that fine new cook stove, she bought that bright, shiny kettle too. But that silly old pot doesn't know that the new kettle is bright and shiny. So it keeps on calling names. That pot doesn't know it's fooling itself. For all it sees is its own homely old black self in the shiny kettle making faces. And that's what comes of calling names, child, chuckled Auntie Rolling Pin as she ended her story. Then Mr. Tea Kettle puffed steam importantly and clapped his little lid. Nothing more was said in the kitchen for several seconds. Thank you, at length, said Mary Frances gratefully, 
to Auntie Rolling Pin. Then she added, very firmly and gently, to Iron Pot and Tea Kettle. I want you to promise me never to call names again, either one of you, for it makes me feel so sad. Do you promise? she asked. I promise, brightly answered Tea Kettle. I pro-promise, solemnly declared Big Iron Pot. End of Chapter 7Chapter 8 of The Mary Frances Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 8 A Potato Lunch. I'm so relieved, said Mary Frances with a sigh. Now I can hurry along the potato lunch. Yes, chimed in Mantelcloth, it's quarter past eleven. You have only three quarters of an hour. That's so, said Mary Frances. The next recipe is number five, baked potatoes. One, choose potatoes of the same size, rather large. Two, scrub well and wipe. Three, bake in a hot oven from thirty to forty-five minutes, or until soft when pressed between thumb and fingers. Four, roll each between the fingers. This makes them mealy. Five, serve on a napkin. Why, I won't need to pare those. I'll put two of these I've washed in the oven. The oven's grand and hot. Let me see. Will all the others need paring? Yes, she laughed. I didn't notice the heading of the chapter before. Potatoes without jackets. Number six, boiled potatoes. One, wash potatoes. Two, pare, throwing into cold water. Three, drain cover with boiling water allowing one tablespoon salt to every twelve potatoes four let boil one half hour or until the largest is soft when pierced with a fork five drain off all the water six shake over fire or place on back of stove to dry off the potatoes number seven mashed potatoes one boil potatoes drain dry off two mash in pan in which they were cooked three for every cupful add one dash pepper one salt spoon salt one half tablespoon butter scant four for every cupful heat two tablespoons milk five throw the heated milk on potatoes six beat with a wire fork until creamy seven pile lightly on a hot dish serve uncovered note remember that all measurements are level or even with the top to divide a spoonful cut it through the middle lengthwise for a half and across that for one quarter of a spoonful number eight potato soup place on the table three freshly boiled potatoes one onion butter parsley flour dredger pepper salt one pint milk two cups one put the milk in the upper part of a double boiler half filling the under part with boiling water two throw in two slices of onion and put double boiler on the stove for ten minutes three mash potatoes and add to the hot milk four add one teaspoon salt and a dash of pepper five put through a wire strainer rubbing the potatoes through with a spoon six put into double boiler and place on stove seven melt one tablespoon butter in a little pan eight throw into it one half tablespoon flour stir well nine dip a little of the hot milk on this stirring well then pour into the soup ten let boil ten minutes eleven add one tablespoon chopped parsley if too thick add hot water or milk twelve serve very hot oh i know how to cook boiled potatoes they're just like jacket boiled only they have their jackets off she cried why certainly exclaimed boiler pan which she had put on the stove half full of water i know my part i just hurry them right along in a jiffy he looked so interested that mary frances laughed as she dropped the potatoes in are they all to be bo boiled stuttered the bubbling boiler pan yes said mary frances all except those i put in the oven listen i'll tell you the menu for billy's potato lunch 
we'll begin of course with soup potato soup puree is the word for thick soup suggested boiler pan it seems more stylish don't you think yes indeed said mary frances i do believe i'll write a card for each of us to have at our places at the table and she quickly brought her school pad from her desk then she wrote menu billy's potato lunch puree of potato potatoes in the shell cold meat mashed potatoes sliced bananas with cream milk that potato in the shell sounds swell said coffee pot but it seems to me you ought to have something to drink like coffee or something of that kind oh that's true mary frances replied but i don't know how to make coffee and mother said i must make everything in the order it came in my book won't you look to see if my turn doesn't come soon interrupted coffee pot not today mary frances shook her head today we have milk why tomorrow as she looked in her book isn't that fine but those potatoes must be done i should think so a minute more and they'd have been burned she said as she drained off the water now ready for the masher quite ready said a little voice and mary frances was not surprised to see potato masher tumble over the edge of boiler pan as she put him on the table push my head down hard said he in a thick mushy voice and mary frances did as he directed suddenly potato masher stopped work how will you know how much potato to put into the soup he asked why said mary frances there were only six boiled ones all together so the three for the soup will be just half pretty good pretty good for a little girl just learning to cook potato masher said and ducked his head into the potatoes again when they were finished mary frances said you know so much about potatoes perhaps you can sit right up on that box pointing to the sugar box and tell me when i make a mistake i'm going to do exactly as my book says you cry out stop when i do anything the wrong way it will be the day of my life ever to be remembered potato masher ran his words together clumsily but i should be very much obliged to you if you would first wash my face why certainly said mary frances i didn't like to suggest it thank you kindly miss tis a pleasure to serve you said the little fellow as he perched himself on the sugar box when mary frances brought him back to the table all ready asked the little girl class proceed said potato masher with a school teacher air only twice did he interrupt her as she followed every direction given in the recipes once to remind her of the potatoes in the oven and again to tell her to pour the soup very slowly lest she burn herself it's magnificent this potato lunch said he as mary frances carried the last smoking dish to the dining table tis a proud day for the assistant chef meaning myself he made a pompous little bow toward the kitchen folks i little thought she'd be on time i was afraid i'd have to strike before she was ready declared mantel clock beginning to strike twelve just as billy came in menus exclaimed the boy jiminy billy's potato lunch he read oh i say if i'd known i'd have dressed for the occasion don't make fun billy begged mary frances make fun cried billy just taste that soup and see if any one could make fun it's fit for the president oh billy mary frances laughed maybe you think i don't mean it said billy helping himself to mashed potatoes why didn't you invite some company i didn't know that potato masher i mean i didn't know it would turn out so well blushed mary frances invite somebody can't i bring bob and eleanor over some day soon to lunch yes said mary frances if aunt maria oh by the way said billy i most forgot aunt maria had word her brother is sick at upland and she went to see him this morning and can't possibly be back in time for breakfast i guessed we'd make out okay i told her i was thinking of our lunches you know billy really asked mary frances but i'm sorry for aunt maria's brother End of chapter eight Chapter 9 of the Mary Frances Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura McKinney. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 9, Mary Frances Gets Breakfast. Mary Frances was a long time getting to sleep that night for thinking about breakfast. She had her little cookbook and Mother's last letter under her pillow. Billy writes your lunches are scrumptious, ran her mother's letter. I cannot tell how much comfort my little girl is to me. I've most a mind to tell Mother about the cookbook, thought Mary Frances. But won't she open her eyes when I tell her I've made everything, if I can keep the secret? I do hope I wake up in time. Father said he'd call me to breakfast when he said good night, but I want to slip down and have everything ready when he comes. So she fell asleep and dreamed she made an angel cake as big as a mountain and that Juby stole it and fed all the hungry cats in the world. She had fixed the curtain so that the first sunlight would fall on her face, and it seemed only a breath of time until she felt it call her. How sleepy she was. I'll get down before the kitchen folks are awake, she whispered. She carried her little shoes in her hand and stole softly downstairs, stopping in the dining room to put them on. Nonsense, you, she recognized the voice of Tea Kettle. Just wait till I read it out of my little book, mimicked a new voice. For shame, you saucy pan, exclaimed Big Iron Pot. Just wait until I read it. Mary Frances peeped into the kitchen. In the middle of the floor stood Little Saucepan, pretending to read out of a book, How to Make Potato Pie Out of Sauerkraut. Silly, exclaimed Potato Masher. Saucepan repeated, To make potato pie out of sauerkraut. 1. Fill eight potatoes with sauerkraut and peel them. 2. Make a crust of the leftovers. 3. Bake the parings well and serve very hot on ice. Just then Mary Frances sneezed. How Saucepan ran and jumped up to his place on the rack. He looked so shamefaced when Mary Frances went in that she hadn't the heart to scold him. Instead, boiled eggs, she called. He pretended to be asleep. Then she took him by the arm and shook him. Boiled eggs, she shouted. Doesn't that mean you? Yes, ma'am, he said meekly. I'm such a sleepy head. Do you know... Confidentially, I often talk in my sleep. At this, the kitchen people grinned. Ahem, <clears throat> said Mary Frances. It's a dangerous habit. Sometimes people tell stories when they're awake, too, she added as she stepped out to get the milk. Is old Puffaway ready? asked Saucepan of Coffee Pot. If you mean tea kettle, Saucy, answered Coffee Pot excitedly, I hope so, for I can scarcely wait till I'm needed. Tea Kettle gave two extra puffs of steam, but otherwise took no notice. How do you know you'll be used? Saucepan asked of Coffee Pot, nudging Pie Plate, who was near him. I come next in the book, and besides, I'm always used for breakfast. Coffee Pot was beginning to get angry. Bet we have eggs, eggs and toast, and tea. Yes, I bet it's tea for B this morning. Saucepan kept on saying, tea for B so long that Coffee Pot began to cry. Eggs and toast and tea, that doesn't mean me. Coffee is better, though not wetter, for breakfast than tea, tea, tea. <laughs> tee hee, tee hee, tee hee, giggled Saucepan, pointing to Coffee Pot tantalizingly, who began to cry in earnest. Why, what's the matter with Coffee Pot? Mary Frances asked when she came in. Is it possible Aunt Maria forgot to dry you last night? Nobody said anything and Saucepan hastily ran toward the stove. Wait, called Mary Frances. Wait a minute until I can look in my book. Oh, I can say it without any book. We all know our own tricks, boasted Saucepan. All right, said Mary Frances. Say it. That will save time. So he began. Biled eggs, excuse me, boiled eggs, he corrected, seeing Mary Frances' stern face. Number nine, boiled eggs. 1. Put eggs in saucepan. 2. Cover with boiling water. 3. Place where the water will keep hot 6 to 10 minutes. A quicker method is to boil eggs very gently 3 or 4 minutes. Why, exclaimed Mary Frances, I thought you dropped the eggs into boiling water for 3 minutes or more. A cordon. That's what Nora said. I asked her what a cordon meant, and she said a cordon to the taste of them that eats them. Soft or hard. 
I was speaking of the best way, declared Sauce Pan, glancing loftily at Mary Frances. There is no end of ways to do it, but this is the scientific way to cook eggs so that they will be soft, but cooked all the way through and easily digested, not liquid inside a hard white coat. In other words, <clears throat> the albumen white of egg cooks much better at a lower than a higher temperature. Woo! whistled Coffee Pot. I wonder how it is in my book, Mary Frances turned to the page. Exactly as you said, she exclaimed. Of course, declared Sauce Pan. Bet he peeped into the book, whispered Coffee Pot to Toaster. Sauce Pan continued. It is somewhat the same with number 10, hard-boiled eggs. One, put eggs in saucepan. Two, cover them with boiling water. Three, place on fire where the water will boil, but very gently, 20 minutes. Thinks he knows it all, grumbled Coffee Pot. He'll be like the frog. He'll burst with pride if he keeps this up. Well, 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 said Mary Frances. I certainly am surprised at what you know. A saucepan is a funny thing, needed by every lassie. Although it may be full of sauce, it may not yet be sassy, sang the little fellow, dancing on the stove. Old Puffaway, he began. That will do, said Mary Frances, and proceeded to pour out the hot water. Tea Kettle is my right-hand man. Don't you dare say another word until I speak to you, as she put in the eggs and drew him to the back of the stove. And now I'll make the coffee. At her side stood Coffee Pot. Are you ready? he asked. Quite ready, she said. Is it really my turn? he asked again. Yes, smiled Mary Frances. It is. Then he began to recite excitedly. Number 11, Coffee. One, put into Coffee Pot one rounded tablespoon ground coffee for each cup needed. Two, pour on boiling water allowing one cup to every tablespoon coffee used. Three, let come to a boil three times, stirring down each time. Four, draw off the fire. Pour in one tablespoon cold water for each cup. Five, let stand in a warm place three minutes to settle grounds. Serve. If not used immediately, strain into another warmed pot. You might pour out the first cupful to clear the nose, I mean spout, then pour it back again. He stopped for breath. Thank you, Coffee Pot, smiled Mary Frances in praise. How interested and wide awake you are. I never sleep much, confided Coffee Pot. I believe it's the coffee. Just catnaps, you know. I sometimes think my heart is affected. I'm so easily stirred up, although I always feel well. If you always feel well, laughed Mary Frances, I guess your heart is all right. Oh, yes, giggled Sauce Pan. He's awfully good-hearted. Didn't I tell you not another word until I spoke to you, said Mary Frances to Sauce Pan, as she lifted Coffee Pot to the table and measured out the coffee and water. After she had followed his directions entirely, she made the toast. Toaster Man was so sleepy he didn't say a word except, You'll do it right, I know and fell asleep again. Just then, Mary Frances heard her father call. End of chapter 9。Chapter 10 of The Mary Frances Cookbook。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 10 The Breakfast Burns Up. Mary Frances, dear, you can get up now, her father was saying. Why, where is my little girl? She knew he was looking in her bedroom. All right, father, she called. I'm up and dressed and downstairs. And father, wait a minute. Breakfast is almost ready. I'll call you in a minute. She ran to put some oranges on the table. You can come now, you and brother, she then called. You sit right down and eat your oranges as I bring in the other things. All right, dear, said her father, but first I want my good morning kiss. A kiss and a bear hug, laughed Mary Frances, throwing her arms around him as he lifted her up. You stole a march on your old father this morning, all right, laughed her father. Breakfast indeed. Why, I was never so surprised in my life. 
oh brother said mary frances kissing billy you and father sit down and i'll bring in the coffee she flew into the kitchen such a place so thick with smoke and steam that all the kitchen people were coughing oh dear dear cried mary frances the tears coming fast everything's burnt up why didn't you call me sillies to sit here and let the toast burn up i i did call you cried coffee pot sputtering more coffee over on the stove but i couldn't make you hear why didn't you call asked mary frances of saucepan with a sob you told me not to speak until you spoke to me i was asleep interrupted toaster who are you talking to mary frances asked her father aren't you nearly ready shh shh warned mary frances with uplifted finger then aloud oh father i'm so disappointed i had everything ready so nice and hot and now everything's burnt up oh dear oh 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 dear never mind honey said her father kissing away her tears never mind there's no hurry this morning i'll fix the fire and you do it all over again but i've wasted all the eggs they're as hard as bricks they cook twenty minutes i forgot them they'll be fine in our salad tonight," said brother i love hard-boiled eggs that way brother you run out in the garden said her father sister is going to have our breakfast ready in a very few minutes i'll do that cried billy and i'll have a fine appetite when they went into the kitchen mary frances saw saucepan whisper something to coffee pot but her father didn't notice he quickly fixed the fire now father begged mary frances please let me do it and i'll have everything on the table in no time ho ho little miss housekeeper doesn't need any help very well i did need help with the fire father said mary frances it was a great help but all right girlie said father i'll read my paper you call us when you're ready in a very few minutes she did call them and a fine breakfast it was too for mary frances knew how so well that not a minute was wasted ain't she the loveliest cook whispered coffee pot to saucepan as mary frances disappeared through the dining-room door with the eggs loveliest ever said saucepan i really was afraid to call her for fear her father would hear i'm so sorry yes nodded toaster man i can't seem to get it off my mind it keeps me so sad won't you tell us a story i can't get it off my mind either said saucepan with a sob but i'll do my best here goes our little miss sat down and cried and called her saucepan to her i feel so very bad inside i wish you'd eat some sugar oh silly interrupted toaster man don't make fun besides you know that's not true well replied saucepan i thought you wanted a story pooh puffed tea kettle what a poor pun i should think you'd all be tired out let's take a nap i just want to say i love our little miss just the same said saucepan and i and i cried all the kitchen people End of chapter 10chapter eleven of the mary frances cookbook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the mary frances cookbook by jane eyre fryer chapter eleven a joke on aunt maria oh hum oh ya 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 yawned tea kettle next morning stretching his funny little arms oh i say he shouted wake up we've overslept wake up everybody where's our little mistress i wonder nice memory yours drawled saucepan don't you remember they all went over to aunt maria hush's for dinner saturday night and for sunday aunt maria hush roared tea kettle that's not her name i'd like to know why not said saucepan every time i go to say anything when she's here somebody says keep still that's aunt maria hush ho 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 he 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 laughed all the kitchen people that meant be still goosey tea kettle explained when aunt maria and mary frances came into the kitchen later the old lady was talking very creditable child she said looking at the shelves all in order very creditable indeed i can't understand it with no one to show you how to i have my little book said mary frances book sniffed aunt maria 
putting the breakfast cereal on to cook book a book can't tell you exactly when a piece of toast is brown enough or a potato just done enough to be mealy nor how to keep a pan from burning book it's talent that's what it is blood will tell you inherited it from me i never burnt pans never in my life there's no excuse for it yes ma'am said mary frances thinking of the ruined breakfast go up and open the beds to air commanded aunt maria when mary frances got back she could scarcely see across the kitchen for smoke fire screamed aunt maria making for boiler pan on the stove i thought the house was on fire she panted snatching it up oh oh i wish i had my smelling salts the porridge is all burnt up what a disgrace mary frances felt very sorry for her but when she saw saucepan and coffee pot holding their queer little fists over their mouths to keep from laughing out and when she remembered how funny the old lady looked making across the kitchen in two steps she ran back into the dining room to laugh i must stop she said to herself and the more she'd say it the more she'd laugh this is dreadful mary frances she'd scold herself but oh my wasn't it funny and away she'd go again at length she went back upstairs until aunt maria called breakfast even at the table she couldn't look at aunt maria without laughing what's the matter asked brother oh don't ask me mary frances begged hiding her face she didn't dare go into the kitchen until after her aunt had gone for fear of disgracing herself laughing when she did go out to look up her next lesson in her little book boiler pan walked dolefully up to her holding out a piece of sandpaper he looked so funny with a big black spot on one eye bowing he began to recite of course you never burn your pans of course no more do i but should such sad things happen a piece of this just try i will exclaim mary frances and in less than a twinkle had rubbed all the burnt spots off my that's better thank you brightly beamed boiler pan mary frances sat down on the rocking chair and opened her book tea omelette she exclaimed isn't that nice just then came a knock at the kitchen door End of chapter 11chapter 12 of the mary frances cookbook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by betty b the mary frances cookbook by jane eyre fryer chapter 12 the tramp mary frances peeped out of the open window a tramp oh dear shall i open the door thought the frightened little girl please miss the oldest hungriest looking tramp she ever saw looked down at her taking off his worn-out cap please miss a cup of tea anything i am that tired and faint he caught hold the railing tea my next lesson thought mary frances that's easy and quick and tea kettle is just beginning to boil how awfully cold and hungry the poor man looks wait a minute she called i almost know how to make tea but i'd better look at the recipe where'd i put my book oh here it is open to the place she spoke softly then she read the directions for making number twelve tea one half fill the teapot with boiling water let stand until thoroughly hot pour out two put into it one teaspoon tea for each cup needed three pour in freshly boiling water allowing one cup to every teaspoon tea four let stand for five minutes in a very warm place but do not let it boil stir and serve if not used immediately strain into another heated pot very soon she had filled the largest cup she could find in the closet and handed it to the tramp that's the bonniest cup of tea i've drank for many a year miss said he it tastes like the old country sure like the old country thought mary frances that's the funniest way for anything to taste i ever heard of maybe he's so hungry he's a little bit out of his head oh i know what i'll do i'll make an omelet for him i don't believe he's eaten omelet since maybe since he was as little as i am maybe a hundred years he looks a hundred years old i'm sure i hope i have eggs to make one oh yes i know there are enough where's the recipe oh here it is number thirteen omelet 
two eggs to each person one separate yolks and whites putting them into different bowls two add dash of salt to whites and dash of salt and white pepper to yolks three add cold water to whites allowing one teaspoon to each four add cold water to yolks allowing one tablespoon to each five beat both very light six melt one tablespoon butter in a smooth frying pan seven pour in yolks let cook a moment eight spread whites over yolks making a little hole in the center for steam to escape nine cook slowly for five minutes or until the puffed up whites look dry ten fold one half over the other eleven turn out on a warm platter twelve trim with parsley and serve at once that's not so easy thought the little girl but i guess i can manage it he'll not be very particular but she had very little trouble for she read what her mother had written and followed each direction exactly all the way through the recipe blessings on ye miss said the tramp as mary frances carried the smoking dish out on the porch to him with a slice of bread and butter you've got a kind heart you have to be sure ain't that whatever it is a beauty it is real pretty said mary frances feeling quite proud i just made it for you i'm learning to cook and i'm here all alone just now except for juby and the kitchen f she caught herself just in time juby is the kitten you know my lessons just came to omelette and why what's the matter with it she cried dismayed it's all fallen flat i wonder if i got it done it gets flatter and flatter the tears sprang to her eyes i'm so sorry she said oh never mind miss said the tramp i ain't been chooser for money a day and this ere omelet or whatever it is will be all right all right and he hungrily began to eat it seems to be made out of nothin and yet it is powerful good said he between bites as it fast disappeared much to mary frances's delight it's made out of beaten eggs said she first you take the eggs and break the shells and put the yolks in one bowl and the why miss i know what made it flounder 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 flat as a flounder thought mary frances he means flatten what she asked eagerly why the breeze the cool air plays the mary frances mary frances mary frances her father came into the kitchen who's there why my dear little girl what are you doing i'm i've got company mary frances stammered not liking to say tramp that is i oh father this gentleman was so hungry and i go into the house and i shall see you be gone thundered her father to the tramp pointing to the gate beggin pardon sir said the tramp touching his cap but may i say one word make it short i do anything for the young lady not let a air on her ed be ert please don't be too hard on her you may go said mary frances's father are you hungry yet oh no sir thank you sir said the tramp thanks to er bless her little art her father heard him murmuring as he went out the gate bless her dear loving little heart echoed her father the poor dear lamb should not have been left alone i thought billy was here but she must have her lesson going into the kitchen he took mary frances on his knee dear he began gravely suppose the old tramp had not had kind thoughts suppose when my little girl opened the door he had hurt her and had taken mother's nice things or had stolen our dear little daughter but father said mary frances he was a lovely gentleman i feel quite sure he was going to tell me a beautiful story about when he was little maybe a hundred years ago mary frances listen child never when you are alone unlock the door to any man or woman you do not know understand yes father said mary frances i didn't mean to be bad no dear but it would be very naughty indeed for you to do so again do you promise yes father said mary frances hiding her face on his shoulder i'll never never do it again dear father Hrumph, grumbled auntie rolling pin after they had gone into the library i'd have warned her only i was afraid the tramp gentleman might hear so would we all of us cried the rest of the kitchen people End of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen Company to Lunch of the Mary Frances Cookbook 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Lawley. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 13. Mary Frances listened at the kitchen door before going in next morning. She wanted to find out what the kitchen people might be doing. It isn't exactly eavesdropping, she thought, although it seems awfully near to it. Can't you find it? somebody was asking. Seems to be having trouble, said Teapot. Of course, he can't very well find out, being so short and fat and having no nose to speak of. Well, nosy, answered Coffee Pot. Suppose you try. Your nose is long enough to poke into anything. So much the better for me this time, Pug Nose. Oh, say, stop calling names, and find out if you can, cried Big Iron Pot. I'll bet it's my turn again, interrupted Saucepan. Now, See if I'm not right. He's peeped already, declared Coffee Pot. Did I haven't, very earnestly. Oh, say, Teapot, if you're any good, get to work. See if he's right. Can you do it? Yes, replied Teapot, rather breathlessly. It seemed to Mary Frances as if he were lifting a heavy weight. Yes. Here is the place. Somebody else read. I'm too tired. I'll read, said Saucepan. What was the last? Oh, yes. Here it is. Just as I said. Oh, go away. Don't let him read, said Coffee Pot. He'll make it up. Read yourself, then, Pug Nose. Then Coffee Pot's voice. I declare. He's right. It is his turn again. Listen. Number 14. White sauce. Two tablespoons butter. Two tablespoons flour. One cup hot milk. Quarter teaspoon salt. Dash of pepper. 1. Melt butter in a saucepan. 2. Mix pepper and salt with flour. 3. Throw into the butter, stirring thoroughly. Cook until it bubbles a little. 4. Pour one-third of the milk very slowly on this, stirring and beating well. 5. Place over fire and stir in the rest of the milk a little at a time. 6. Let boil a minute. Hook nose. Stop calling names, said Iron Pot. Good, thought Mary Frances. Honorable Mr. Coffee Pot Esquire, said Saucepan mockingly. Mary Frances could easily imagine him bowing. Allow me to call your attention to the unimpeachable veracity of myself. Crazier and crazier, commented Coffee Pot sadly. Did you say anything? Sir, said Saucepan, to put it into kindergarten words, I remarked, Saucepan, meaning myself, has rightly been likened to George Washington. Or, oh, puffed Tea Kettle. What I'm more interested in is the book. What do they use white sauce for? There's a footnote, Teapot ventured. Read it, demanded Tea Kettle. White sauce is very good to pour over cooked vegetables, like... Wait a minute, interrupted Tea Kettle. Perhaps Saucepan can tell us. New boiled potatoes, green cabbage, etc. Also nice to use for warming over cooked meats, like cold chicken and canned salmon. Both make a nice luncheon dish. Fine, thought Mary Frances. There's a can of salmon in the pantry. Is that right? asked Tea Kettle. Right, 
said Teapot. Next is... Number 15. Baked Apples 1. Wipe large apples 2. Take out cores with apple core or sharp knife 3. Place in earthen or enamel dish 4. Fill center of each apple with sugar 5. Pour water into dish, allowing 2 tablespoons to each apple 6. Bake in a hot oven one half hour or until soft. A joyful surprise. A deep voice seemed to come from the closet. Who's that? asked Tea Kettle. Oh, it's Baking Dish. You startled me. Although I'm not paid proper respect for my years, went on the deep voice. How old are you now, anyway? asked Tea Kettle. I've been told I'm very old. My grandsire was a Tory, often bought and often sold, but that's another story. What an honour, sniggered Saucepan. How rude, said Coffee Pot. No child, came the deep voice of Baking Dish, only modern, without reference for the old and... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Nine, ten, eleven, struck in mantel clock very loudly. Oh my goodness, exclaimed Mary Frances to herself. It's time to commence lunch. I do thank mantel clock for reminding me. Let me see, she said, going into the kitchen as if she had just come downstairs, although she felt very guilty. I must find today's lesson. She read quietly for some time pretending not to notice that she found the book open with the spout of teapot lying against one of the pages. I can make white sauce in a jiffy, and I'll heat some canned salmon in it, she exclaimed, picking up saucepan quite carelessly. He needs a lesson, and I don't need his help, she thought. I'll treat him quite indifferently. The salmon ought to have been opened an hour or two ago, said a sharp little voice. Mary Frances looked around to see who her new helper could be, but could discover no one. How do you know? she asked, more to find out who was speaking than to gain information. Who'd know better? came the little voice. So sharp, it was little more than a squeak. I'm can opener. Oh, so you are, cried Mary Frances, spying him. I'm glad to see you. Now, why open the salmon an hour ago? All canned goods ought to be opened an hour or two before needed, and turned out, explained Can Opener, to get well aired. Thank you, said Mary Frances. I'll open the salmon right away. Then see to the apples, then the white sauce. She had only just finished the white sauce when the doorbell rang. She stopped to take the baked apples out of the oven before answering it. It was Billy, with Robert and Eleanor, who lived down the street. Hello, sister, said Billy. I told you I'd bring company home to lunch some day. Anything ready? By good luck, Billy. Yes, said Mary Frances, kissing Eleanor and taking her coat and hat, while Billy did the same for Robert. I know now why Mother likes Father to telephone when he's bringing home company to dinner, laughed Mary Frances. Oh, don't you worry, folks, said Billy. Everything will be all right. That's the highest compliment a boy can pay, Mary Frances, you know, said Eleanor. I wish I could cook, she sighed, when Mary Frances dished the dessert of baked apples, and the three praised everything on the table. I wish you could, sis, exclaimed Robert. Maybe some day I'll teach you some of the things I can make, said Mary Frances. Oh, Mary Frances, will you? cried Eleanor. If your mother says so, nodded Mary Frances. I know she will 
declared Eleanor. She hates to cook, but she'll let me learn. She never goes into the kitchen if she can help it. And no wonder, our kitchen is an awful place to go into. Maggie is so cross. She wouldn't let me try. Pity the poor kitchen people, thought Mary Frances. Oh, we'll have fun, she said out loud. When will you want me to come? Eleanor asked. Sometime, when I get near to the end of my book, I'll let you know. Won't that be lovely? I'll bring my own bowl and spoon. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 A Patent Dishwashing of the Mary Frances Cookbook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Alan Lawley The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer Chapter 14 Oh my, sighed Mary Frances, gazing at the great pile of dirty dishes on the kitchen table, where she had carried them after the company had gone. Oh my, cooking is fun, but washing dishes is another thing. I'm most tired, enough to drop, and there must be a hundred dishes to do. I'm glad tea kettle is full of hot water. Bubble, bubble, piff, piff, puffed tea kettle, mysteriously smiling, as though he knew something was about to happen. Mary Frances couldn't see anything very pleasing, with so much of a task before her. She put the large dish pan on the table, and poured in the water, whirling the soap around in it, several times to make it less suddy. Then she sat down to rest. Really. I didn't know I was so tired, she thought. Maybe my age is telling on me the way Aunt Maria says. Her weary little head began to nod, and she was soon fast asleep. She hadn't been asleep long before she was aroused by a great racket. Click, clack, clickety clack, splash. Come! she said to herself rather sharply. I do believe you've been asleep, Mary Frances. You'd better get to work, child. Click, clack, again came the sound. With her sleepy lids half open, she glanced towards the table, and such a sight she never saw. She sat up, with mouth and eyes wide open, but nobody paid any attention to her, there were the dishes, jumping higgledy piggledy, pell mell, into the dishpan. First a cup, followed by a saucer, then a spoon, followed by a fork. Make room for me, cried Clatter, diving in head first. Look out, or you'll chip me, cried Teacup, tumbling out on the other side of the pan. I'm next, a big dinner plate splashed in. Kerplunk. Mary Frances couldn't say a word. She was so afraid they might break their heads. Ow! This is hot! screamed Little Pitcher. All the other kitchen people were looking on and laughing. Auntie Rolling Pin was rocking to and fro, laughing so hard the tears were rolling down her cheeks. When the Yellow Bowl bounced into the water, Chase yourself, cried Soup Ladle, making hard after. In less time than it takes to tell, the dishes were all clean and had piled themselves up neatly on the table. Then Mary Frances realized what had happened. That was a painted dishwashing, she said. I don't want you to do that often. I was afraid my mother's china would be broken all to pieces. But... I am very much obliged this time, I'm sure. End of chapter 14 
Chapter Fifteen, Thimble Biscuits, of the Mary Frances Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Lawley, the Mary Frances Cookbook, by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 15 Mary Frances carried all her dolls to the window seat in her room and placed them in a row. Then she held up an envelope. Mrs. Angelina, Marie, Cosset, Lady Gay, Peg, Master Alfonso. Why, listen, here's a letter come for you. What can it be? Pay very strict attention while I read it. If you'd gone to school every day, I'd been so busy, perhaps you could read it yourselves. But of course, when my hands are so full, I can't possibly get you off. You are so helpless. Aren't you ashamed? I think yes. I think you all look ashamed, except Peg. If you don't look ashamed in one minute, Peg, just one minute, I'll give you... You shan't hear this. There, that would do. You needn't cry, dear child. Now I'll read. Mary Frances cut open the envelope. Every doll looked deeply interested except poor Peg, who had fallen on her side. Why, it's an invitation to a doll's party. Listen. My dear dollies, may I have the pleasure of your company at a doll's kitchen party? This afternoon at three o'clock. Yours loving, Mistress Mary Frances. P.S. Anyone coming late will be fined a pink ribbon. In case she hasn't a pink ribbon, her hair will be pulled. M.F. Now, dears, Mary Frances smiled upon them. No wonder you look surprised. But that's a grand invitation. All written out on real paper. I had an awful time getting it to sound right. I'm not sure that it is just exactly correct yet. So we'll get dressed right away. Now, don't all ask at once what you'll wear. Yes, Fonzie, of course you'll wear your dress suit. What of it if it isn't proper to wear it until after six o'clock? You have only your work clothes and that suit, and you'll have to wear your best. Everybody was quiet and good as gold while Mary Frances finished dressing them. There, she said to herself, the last sash is tied. Goodness, I'm tired. Tireder than if I'd been cooking the whole morning. Aren't those stupid compared with kitchen folks? I do wonder what the kitchen folks would do. Will they talk before them? Now, you dolls, be good and take a nap, she warned, so that you won't be sleepy at the party. I must go and get ready. As she tied on her apron in the kitchen, she noticed Auntie Rolling Pin looked very anxious and excited. She couldn't seem to keep still, but kept rolling to and fro, watching Mary Frances's every motion. Well, Auntie Rolling Pin, said Mary Frances. Did you or did you not please, asked Auntie Rolling Pin, mention biscuits this morning? I guess I did, replied Mary Frances, when I glanced at my book. Here, I'll read it out. Number 16. Thimble Biscuits. Nice for doll's tea party. One cup flour, two teaspoons baking powder, one tablespoon butter, Half cup milk, scant. Quarter teaspoon salt. 1. A hot oven and a greased pan. 2. Sift flour, baking powder and salt three times. 3. Rub butter lightly into the flour. 4. Pour the milk on gradually, mixing all the while with a knife, until a soft dough is formed. 
perhaps not all the milk would be needed. 5. Turn the dough on a well-floured board. 6. Pat it with a rolling pin until quarter inch thick. 7. Use a large thimble as a cutter and cut biscuits as close to each other as possible. 8. Place in a pan a little distance apart. 9. Bake about 5 minutes. Number 17. Baking Powder Biscuits 1. Make exactly the same as thimble biscuits. Number 16. Only pat the dough out about 3 quarters of an inch thick. Prick with a fork. 2. Cut with a biscuit cutter and place in pan a little distance apart. 3. Bake in a quick oven from 12 to 14 minutes. Ever make any biscuits, child? No, Auntie Rolling Pin. But I believe I can with your help, if you'll be so kind. Did I will, child? Auntie Rolling Pin gave a delighted chuckle. I've been waiting patiently for the chance. I'm going to give a doll's kitchen party, Auntie. Ah, I'm glad you told me, child. That makes everything more important than ever. So, as you gather together the things you'll need, you can listen um, to Auntie Rolling Pin's wisdom. You know about most everything, said Mary Frances. I'd be much obliged to you for any other hints during the rest of my lessons. I'll be glad to help, child, said Auntie. Mother expected to explain everything to me, you see. Yes, yes, child, smiled Auntie Rolling Pin, seeing Mary Frances look sad. But I see you have sifted the flour and baking powder and salt into a bowl and poured it back. Instead of using a bowl, it's a good idea to use a piece of heavy paper. When this is folded funnel-like, the flour can readily be poured into the sifter again and again. That certainly is easier, said Mary Frances, putting the hint to practice. In order to get the baking powder into every bit of the flour, they should be sifted together three times. Now, I see you are working the butter into the flour. Rub lightly with your fingertips. That's it. Pour the milk gradually, mixing well. The dough should be almost sticky, but not too soft to handle. Now it's my turn, she chuckled, as Mary Frances turned the dough on a well-floured board. But if you're going to make thimble biscuits, one half of the dough is enough to pat out for them. And I can make the rest into real biscuits. What a splendid idea, said Mary Frances. Wonder if the handles are her ears, she thought, softly patting the dough with Auntie Rolling Pin. As she bent over, she caught the sound of singing. And this is the song Auntie Rolling Pin sang. Roly-poly, roly-poly, to and fro. Roly-poly, roly-poly, o'er the dough. Round as an apple, straight as a rule. Guess who am I, or I'll send you to. Where? She asked, suddenly stopping. Mary Frances jumped. She had been rolling Auntie Rolling Pin to and fro, unconsciously keeping time with her song. Where? she again demanded, her mouth full of flour. Dear me, answered Mary Frances, I don't know. School, of course, laughed Auntie Rolling Pin. I thought you'd surely know. Oh yes, of course, laughed Mary Frances, cooking school. Certainly, child, laughed Auntie Rolling Pin. To what other school could you go to learn about me? That's beautiful poetry, said Mary Frances. I think so, smiled Auntie Rolling Pin. I made it up myself. It's so flowery, 
you know, blowing the white dust in the air. Tee hee, giggled Mary Frances. Auntie Rolling Pin looked offended. Excuse me, said Mary Frances. You mean flowery. I mean what I say, said Auntie Rolling Pin. Isn't that what I said? As it certainly was what she said, and Mary Frances didn't like to explain, she hastily turned to her work. It didn't take long to cut the biscuits, as she had often helped her mother in baking. She knew how to dip the cutter each time into flour, that the dough might not stick. She used the large thimble she had brought down from the sewing room in the same way as she had used the biscuit cutter. Aren't they too sweet? she cried delightedly, as she laid the tiny biscuits side by side, but not touching, in the little baking pan. With the rest of the dough, she had made three larger ones, one for each of the family, she said, slipping them with the thimble biscuits into the oven. Let me see what's next. Oh yes, the cocoa. I do declare, it's little saucepan's turn again. No wonder he's puffed up, she thought. Strange, he hasn't said a word. I'm most sure I have to use saucepan. Perhaps he doesn't understand. I'll read aloud. Number 18. Cocoa. For each cup, one tablespoon cocoa, one tablespoon sugar, half cup boiling water, half cup milk. 1. Heat milk. 2. Mix cocoa and sugar. 3. Pour boiling water on them gradually, making a smooth paste. 4. Add the milk and cook a half minute. 5. Beat with an egg beater. Silence. Saucepan? One of the kitchen people near him whispered loudly. Saucepan? Why don't you speak? Don't bother me. I'm asleep, muttered Saucepan drowsily. Sound asleep. Mary Frances gasped. What an awful story, exclaimed the one who had first spoken. You're not very polite to question my word to my very face, Saucepan retorted angrily. Now, if someone else had told you, that would have been different. Then you'd had some excuse. Come, thought Mary Frances. That's too silly. I'll put an end to this. I don't need any help with this simple recipe. Seizing saucepan quite carelessly, she quickly made the cocoa. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of the Mary Frances Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary L. Carlyle. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 16. The Doll's Kitchen Party. Now everything is ready, she said, glancing carefully at the table she had set with her little dishes. I'll go up and bring the dolls. Wait a minute, Mary Frances, she added after a moment's pause. Let's see if everything is ready. There's thimble biscuits, jam, cocoa. Better look in the oven. Oh my, I'm glad you thought me, Auntie Rolling Pin, cried Mary Frances, opening the oven door. Oh dear me, most of the thimble biscuits are burnt up and the big ones are just done, I guess. The thicker things are, the slower the oven, child. The thinner, the hotter the oven. Auntie Rolling Pin, cried Mary Frances, not realizing she had interrupted. There are enough thimble biscuits not burnt to go round, isn't that good? And the dolls can't make themselves sick with them. It's not much of a waste, smiled Auntie Rolling Pin, and, seeming to be seriously thinking, the dolls can't make themselves sick on them, eating too many, I suppose. Well, said Mary Frances, you see, it's like this. When I, my dolls, invite to tea, it is a pretty sight to see the things one seldom gets to eat all on the table spread so sweet. 
but to my dollies I explain, don't eat too much, you'll have a pain. Then just to save them such a trial, I let them sit and look a while. Add cakes and tarts and candies too, then eat them up myself, wouldn't you? For thus they're saved from being ill, and I likewise a doctor's bill. But just between you, dear, and me, they couldn't eat at all, you see. And away ran Mary Frances to bring the dolls. It was a lovely tea party, wasn't it, Angie? sighed Mary Frances, putting her family to bed after it was all over. And you did behave a credit to your mother. I feel sure now you will remember all I've taught you. Not one of you would eat soup from the point of a spoon, nor spread a whole slice of bread at once, nor leave your spoon in your cup, which is a great comfort to a mother. Only pay, you poor child. You should not have spilled that cocoa down your best dress. But children will be children, I suppose, and your very dear children. I wouldn't have them for the world jealous of the kitchen people, and I've neglected them shamefully of late. I'm not much taken with these things called dolls, Auntie Rolling Pin, said Saucepan, seating himself on the edge of the top closet shelf and crossing one leg over his knee. They're not much use. Ah, sighed Auntie Rolling Pin, looking wise, a doll's a doll for all that. Of course, said Saucepan, but a doll's no good boiled. Well, no, admitted Auntie Rolling Pin, the best, of course, are baked of number 19 gingerbread cookies. Half cup molasses, two tablespoons butter, two tablespoons lard flour, half a tablespoon ginger, half a teaspoon salt, half a teaspoon baking soda, one tablespoon warm water. Number one, warm the molasses. Number two, put the butter and lard in a bowl, pour over them the molasses. Number three, dissolve soda in the warm water, add to the molasses. Number four, sift ginger, salt, and half cup flour together. Number five, sift into the molasses, beating well. If necessary, add more flour to make a soft dough. Number six, grease a shallow pan. Number seven, roll the dough out one third inch thick. Number eight, cut out with a little round cutter, dipping it into flour each time. Place cookies some distance apart on the pan. Bake about 10 minutes. Note, instead of rolling out, Little spoonfuls may be dropped far apart on the pan and flattened with the bottom of a round tin cup. Then you, oh, Auntie Rolling Pin, nobody's doing a lesson. Besides, after it's baked, it's done, cried Sauce Pan impatiently. So am I, smiled Auntie Rolling Pin. End of chapter 16. Recording by Marielle Carlyle. Chapter 17 of The Mary Frances Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 17 The Sick Neighbor. Mary Ann Hooper is very ailing, said Aunt Maria at the lunch table. She had invited the children over to lunch that day. She needs nourishment more than anything else, I should say. That cook she has can't make a decent thing. No wonder she's weak. If only, thought Mary Frances, if only I could cook something for her. Wait until I look in my book. I wonder if she could eat today's lesson. She laughed aloud. That seems so funny. Well, snapped Aunt Maria, of all things, to laugh at a poor sick neighbor in such a predicament. Mary Frances blushed, but she didn't say anything. After lunch, she started home as soon as possible. Once in the house, she ran to the kitchen for her book. Of all things, as Aunt Maria would say, she cried, it comes next. Number 20, soft custard. One cup milk, one egg, two tablespoons sugar, dash of salt, nutmeg. One, heat the milk smoking hot. Two, beat egg, add sugar and salt. Three, pour the hot milk on beating well. Four, Pour into upper part of double boiler, or set pan in boiling water. 5. Cook until it thickens, or until a coating will be formed on a clean spoon when dipped into the custard. 6. Sprinkle with a few gratings of nutmeg. 7. Serve cold. How perfectly lovely, exclaimed Mary Frances. I'll make soft custard for Mary Ann Hooper. But that isn't very much. Oh, isn't this too good? I can serve it on the next recipe. It's 
number twenty one steamed rice one half cup rice two cups boiling water one half teaspoon salt one wash rice this may be easily done by putting in a strainer and shaking in a pan of cold water two put with the salt and boiling water into the upper part of a double boiler three pour boiling water into lower part and cook one hour four to test whether it is done press several grains between the fingers if not perfectly soft cook longer five if it becomes hard and dry add a little boiling water from time to time six a few raisins are sometimes cooked with the rice add these during the last fifteen minutes of cooking to prevent discoloring seven serve with soft custard or cream and sugar plain cooked rice may be served as a vegetable number twenty two boiled rice use a plain boiler and a large quantity of salted boiling water one half cup rice five cups boiling water one half teaspoon salt one wash rice by putting it in a strainer and shaking in a pan of water two drop a few grains at a time into boiling water stirring well to prevent sticking three boil rapidly twenty five minutes or until soft when pressed between the fingers four drain through a colander pour over it two cups boiling water five set in a warm place to dry off until ready to serve yes said mary frances putting the rice on to boil i'll make both oh won't mary ann hooper be pleased who's that asked auntie rolling pin a new kind of cooking pan no no auntie rolling pin laughed mary frances she's an old lady who is sick aunt maria told me about her at lunch she's such a funny old lady it isn't funny to be ill said aunty rolling pin no answered mary frances seriously but i meant she does such funny things last summer she told elvin phelps if he didn't keep his bees from stealing honey out of her flowers she'd shoot them she oh dear wanted him to tie each one by his hind leg to keep them home oh dear laughed mary frances what did he do asked aunty rolling pin anxiously he told her excuse my laughing but it's so funny he would rather put a no trespassing sign up in her garden for them to read ho ho tee hee mary frances shook with laughter silence in the kitchen until mary frances felt a tug at her dress looking down she spied toaster man yes you may speak she smiled thank you i don't like to suggest but a dropped egg on toast would be grand finished mary frances i'm sure i saw that recipe yes this is it number twenty three poached eggs one put a pint two cups boiling water into a shallow pan add one half teaspoon salt two break egg in a saucer three whirl the water round and round with a spoon and draw pan back on stove where it will simmer but not boil hard four slip the egg into the whirling water five cook until the white is coated over the top six serve on toast note it is best to cook only one egg at a time ready hum tea kettle ready exclaimed saucepan and mary frances poured the hot water ready cried toaster man and mary frances made the toast oh cried the little girl suddenly her fingers crushing through the eggshell what a shame a sharp rap with a knife and a quick pull with a thumb somebody said thank you smiled mary frances too busy to discover who was her helper very soon she had lifted the poached egg with perforated skimmer on the piece of toast when she had arranged the tray she brought it out for the kitchen people to see she had used her mother's daintiest china plates and had scattered violets here and there over the cloth beautiful they exclaimed in one voice as though that was all that could be said but this is what mary frances heard as she closed the door wish i could eat sighed toaster man i know jubal wants some of that he added after a moment that cat can eat any time of day i envy her appetite humph exclaimed saucepan jube won't get any of that this time jube will get a great big round piece of nothing End of chapter seventeen Chapter 18 of the Mary Frances Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Marielle Carlyle. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyer Fryer. Chapter 18. A Man's Lunch. Mother writes that she is so glad you are giving Billy such good lunches, said Father, looking up from his letter. I've been waiting a long time for an invitation to lunch, little daughter. Do you know I'll be quite jealous of Billy if my turn doesn't come soon? Oh, Father, Mary Frances begged, won't you come tomorrow? I didn't think you could get away from the store, and I don't know so very much to cook. Thank you, Miss Mary Frances. I'll be most happy to lunch with you tomorrow, said Father, in a real society tone. When Mary Frances went into the kitchen next morning, she said, I guess I'll make the dessert first. Rice pudding is good cold. It is excellent cold, spoke the deep voice of baking dish, especially if made by number 24 rice pudding. Three tablespoons rice, a fourth cup sugar, one-eighth teaspoon salt, sprinkling nutmeg, four cups milk or three cups milk and one cup water. Step one. Pick over the rice and wash by putting in a strainer and shaking in a pan of water. Step two. Butter the baking dish. Step three. Stir rice, sugar, and salt into the milk. Step four. Pour into the baking dish. Step five. Sprinkle with nutmeg. Step six. Cover with a lid and bake slowly two hours. Step seven. Uncover and brown half hour. Note. Seeded raisins may be added before browning. If desired, a thin, narrow shaving of the outside rind of a lemon may be used as flavoring. Put this in the milk with the rice. Why, thank you, baking dish, exclaimed Mary Frances. Will you kindly say it over slowly? I'll do it then, keeping time with your directions. This he did, and as Mary Frances slipped him into the oven, I'm sure this will be good, he said. I can always tell. I'm very glad, said Mary Frances gratefully. Now for the boiled mutton, she said. I guess, Iron Pot, you can tell me about that. Yes, ma'am, said Iron Pot, importantly climbing from the shelf and eyeing critically the piece of meat Mary Frances had placed on the table. That's a pretty nice cut of meat, pretty nice. It will be all right to cook it, as I will tell you. But really, mutton is less greasy if it is boiled long enough before needed to let the gravy cool. Take off the cake of fat, which will form on the top when cold. Of course, take the meat out as soon as it is tender, and after skimming the gravy, put it in again to reheat. I haven't time, said Mary Frances anxiously. You can put yours in a bowl and stand the bowl in ice water to cool the liquor quickly and do the same thing that way. Now, you give the recipe? asked Mary Frances. Iron Pot looked pleased and began. Number 25, boiled mutton. About three pounds rack of mutton or yearling. Step 1. Wipe with a damp cloth. Step 2. Pour 3 cups boiling water into a large pot. Step 3. Throw in 2 peeled onions. Step 4. Put in the meat. Cover. Step 5. Boil 10 minutes. Step 6. Draw pot to back of stove where it will simmer or just bubble until meat is tender when tried with a fork, which will be in about one and a half hours. Step 7. Take out the meat. Step 8. Skim off the fat from the surface of the liquor or if there is time, cool and remove the hardened fat. Correct, exclaimed Saucepan, bending over Mary Frances's book, and the gravy is made saucy, began Iron Pot in a boiling rage, but he suddenly stopped as Mary Frances shook her finger at him. It's all right this time, she said. It is your place, Saucepan. It is my place, said Saucepan, trying not to let Iron Pot see how pleased he was to tell about number 26, sauce or gravy for boiled mutton. Step one, after cooling and skimming off the fat, measure the water in which the meat was boiled. Step two, to each cupful allow one tablespoon flour, one fourth teaspoon salt, one half teaspoon vinegar. Step three, moisten these with a little cold water. Step four, stir them into the boiling gravy. Step five, add one tablespoon finely minced parsley. Thank you both, my friends, said Mary Frances, lifting Iron Pot. My, but you're heavy. Tis true, said Iron Pot sadly. All my old-fashioned friends, like Iron Tea Kettle, glancing toward the new tea kettle, and Cauldron are gone. But, he added, brightening up, it has been proved that for boiling meats, no modern lightweights could do them up so brown. We'll prove it again, laughed Mary Frances. I do believe I'll have a splendid lunch for father, a regular big man's lunch. Listen, boiled mutton, parsley sauce, boiled potatoes, rice pudding, coffee. 
And now I'll set the table. I think I'll use the very best silver and the prettiest dishes. It will please father, I know. This is the way Mary Frances set the table for her father and Billy's lunch. Mary Frances sat in her mother's place. Just as Mary Frances was finishing getting the lunch, the phone bell rang and Billy answered. This is what Mary Frances heard. Hello? Yes. Too bad, father, can't you? Well, I'll tell her, but I hate to, awfully. She's been hard at work all the morning. I? Oh, I attended to the fire for her, then went upstairs to make those drawings. Oh, yes, I'll look after her all right. Yes, she is a regular brick. All right, goodbye. Sis! I know, Billy, Mary Frances sobbed. I know, father can't come and everything is ready. Oh, dear, oh, oh, dear. Oh, I say, sister, said Billy. I'll pretend I'm father. Won't that do? And, oh, yes, I'll show you how to fold a napkin into Cinderella's slipper. Where did you learn how? Mary Frances began to dry her tears. Not on land and not on sea did this knowledge come to me. When I learned, I had on my hat. Where was I? Now riddle me that. No lady fair, not up in the air, on a boat in the river. Silly Billy, exclaimed Mary Frances. Please show me the trick now, will you? Yes, said Billy, and then I'll eat father's share, as well as mine, of a very grand lunch if my nose isn't deceiving me. Well, said Mary Frances, that will help some, but please fold the napkin. And Billy showed her this. Step one, fold napkin twice, making it fourfold, making crease through the center as shown in figure one. Step two, fold each end along dotted line in figure one over to center crease. Then the napkin will be in the form of figure two. Step three, fold napkin again along dotted line in figure two over to center. Then it will look like figure three. Step four, fold the napkin together along center crease. Bring one side exactly over the other. Then the napkin will look like figure four. Fold one side along dotted line in figure four, turning end under and bringing it up as shown in figure five. Step six, fold along dotted line in figure five, bringing point A over to meet letter B then the napkin will look like figure six. Tuck the end A into opening AB, folding along dotted line in figure six, and stand slipper as in figure seven. Fold back and spread open the top. Into which slip candy or flowers? Mary Frances was so pleased with Cinderella's slipper that she folded all the napkins on the lunch table. Looks like a hotel table, said Billy. Well, Billy, said Mary Frances, I know fancy folded napkins aren't so nice for home, but you don't mind. Indeed, no, said Billy. I feel proud. While they were at lunch, there came a knock, and a boy from the store handed in a box of candy and a little note addressed to Miss Mary Frances. Ahem, said Billy, as Mary Frances opened the box and offered him some candy. Since father couldn't come, he sent a sweet guest in his place. It isn't very nice to eat up your guest, laughed Mary Frances. Mary Frances, asked Billy, what's better than a cream chocolate? Two cream chocolates, I guess, said Mary Frances, passing the box. But Billy, listen, dear Miss Mary Frances, my little girl's disappointment in not having her father to lunch today can scarcely equal his. A very wicked man came on business from a long distance and prevented me from being hungrily yours father. P.S. Please accept candy with my love. The 3rd of September. End of chapter 18. Recording by Marielle Carlyle. Chapter 19 of the Mary Frances Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary L. Carlyle. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 19 Poor Blue Pitcher. Why, said Mary Frances, looking over her book next morning at the breakfast table, Today's lesson is so easy, I think it would be just the time to invite Eleanor over for her cooking lesson. I do wonder whether the kitchen people will talk and help us, or whether they can help but one person. It would be pretty hard without their help, but let me read the recipe again. Number 27. Apple Snow 1. Pare and slice apples, dropping into cold water. 2. Cook slowly until soft. 3. Mash well and measure. 4. To every cupful allow 1 fourth cup powdered sugar, white of 1 egg, well beaten. 5. Add a spoonful of each to apples until used, 
stirring in lightly each time. 6. Add one drop vanilla for each cup of apples. 7. Serve with cream. I guess I'll go ask the kitchen people about it right away. But someone was talking. Wonder what little mistress will cook today. I'll see if they know, said Mary Frances to herself. It's hard to remember so far ahead, complained Coffee Pot. I wish it was my turn all the time. Oh, you have more chance than most of us, except Tea Kettle, exclaimed Sauce Pan. I expect, though, most of us will be used a lot now, airily. Why? Oh, I read a poem about it, which proves... Say it, interrupted several kitchen people. What fun, thought Mary Frances. I'll try to remember it. All right, said Sauce Pan, proudly beginning to recite. The good old times are back, they say. Now people eat six times a day. Nothing they eat is quite so good as victuals, eatables, and food. They'll eat em cooked, they'll eat em raw, while they have teeth with which to chaw. Beautiful, exclaimed the kitchen people. If that isn't too silly for anything in the world. It was a new voice. Mary Frances peeped out. Big Blue Pitcher was near the edge of the shelf. It's perfectly true, though, retorted Sauce Pan angrily. There, there, said Auntie Rolling Pin soothingly. Don't get so excited. Of course it's true. You bet it's true, and I can prove it. Oh, my ear, cried Blue Pitcher, toppling dangerously near the edge of the shelf. Prove it, prove it, you can't. You conceited, idiotical old saucepan, I dare you. Over he went, crash, broken into pieces. He's dead, exclaimed the excited kitchen people, and began to wring their funny little hands and to cry, Oh, why did he die? Oh, why did he die? Oh, why did he die? Did he die, die, die? They kept up this chant until Mary Frances stepped out into the kitchen. Why did he die? demanded Mary Frances, but not a word was answered. What will mother say, she said, sweeping up the broken pieces of poor blue pitcher. Won't she be sorry? Yes, she will, said Saucepan, but it was his own fault. I think Jubiel will be sorrier. She thought blue pitcher one of her best friends. They were very confidential. Only yesterday I heard her telling him that always after eating a hearty meal for which she had no appetite, she felt hungry. What did Blue Pitcher say? asked Auntie Rolling Pin. Never paid any attention, just said, Humph, Juby, I know where a lot of cattails grow. You do, do you? said Juby. I'd like to know. On little kittens, said Blue Pitcher. The kitchen people laughed. Bet Saucepan made that all up, whispered Coffee Pot. No, said Saucepan, overhearing. I, I don't tell tales. End of chapter 19 Recording by Marielle Carlyle. Chapter 20 of the Mary Frances Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Patterson. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 20. Mary Frances Gives a Cooking Lesson. Come, said Mary Frances. This is enough nonsense for one day. Now, kitchen people, I promise to give a friend of mine a cooking lesson. If I bring her now, can you help us, as you generally do me? No, child said Auntie Rolling Pin, smiling. But perhaps you have learned by this time pretty nearly well enough to do an easy lesson without our help. We can't talk before other people, you know. Perhaps the little girl's own kitchen people will help her sometime. Well, it's a very easy lesson, I think. Apple snow, she added. And a promise is a promise. Yes, interrupted Sauce Pan. You can get along nicely with that recipe. Perhaps I can, said Mary Frances happily. I'll go over for Eleanor now. The little girls had a lovely time doing just as Mary Frances' mother had written in the recipe. 
The kitchen people watched out of the corners of their eyes, but never said a word. Oh, isn't this good? sighed Eleanor, eating the light, delicious dessert. Then, Mary Frances, I know, I'm going to ask my mother for a cookbook. I wonder if you'll let me borrow yours sometime to show her. Of course, laughed Mary Frances. Just then there was a ring at the doorbell. In came Aunt Maria with a mysterious looking bundle. Why, my dear, you have company. I see, said the old lady with a smile. Yes, ma'am, said Eleanor. Mary Frances has been giving me a cooking lesson. Mary Frances shook her head and put her finger to her mouth, but Eleanor didn't understand. A cooking lesson, exclaimed Aunt Maria. A cooking lesson. Mary Frances, a cooking lesson. Then she began to laugh. Oh, my dear, she said. I'm so happy. I'm crying. Silly old me. And she wiped the tears from her spectacles. Mary Frances, dear, she said at length. I heard about the lovely things you made Mary Ann Hooper. And I found out, too, by wheedling it out of her about the cooking lessons. And here's a surprise for you and she handed the bundle to the little girl. Oh, Aunt Maria, cried Mary Frances, unwrapping it. Look, Eleanor, a little cap and an apron. To wear at your cooking lessons, fluttered Aunt Maria. How dear and lovely, trying them on. Look, Eleanor, they just fit. You're the happiest girl in the world, sighed Eleanor. I should be, if mother were really well, said Mary Frances. But she's much better and is coming home soon, Aunt Maria, she added. Oh, I want you to share the secret. I'm doing all the lessons she had written out for me in my cookbook to surprise her when she comes home. Good, said Aunt Maria. I'll tell you. You can get dinner ready the day she comes. Wouldn't that be perfectly lovely, said Mary Frances. Then suddenly thinking, Oh, Aunt Maria, excuse me, please. Won't you have some of our lesson? Some of the apple snow we made for our lesson, I mean? I'd appreciate the kindness, said the old lady a little stiffly, as though a bit ashamed of her softness a moment ago. But after tasting the treat, she said, It's the most beautiful snow I ever saw, little girls. Even more beautiful than that on which I, so many years ago, used to pull a sled. End of chapter 20。Chapter 21 of the Mary Frances Cookbook。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 21 The Picnic. Can't guess where I'm going today, laughed Mary Frances, coming into the kitchen next morning. To the circus? guessed Saucepan. Mary Frances shook her head. Not today. To the fair? guessed Coffee Pot. Nope. To the zoological garden? guessed Saucepan, again beginning to recite. The pancans went to the zoo. It long had been their wish to see the baking panimals with the wildly chafing dish. Wrong, laughed Mary Frances. All wrong. Perhaps this will help you guess, opening the cookbook. Number 28. Stuffed Eggs. 1. 
hard boil eggs two drop into cold water remove shells three cut each in half lengthwise four turn out yolks into a bowl five carefully place whites together in pairs six mash yolks with back of a spoon seven for every six yolks put into the bowl one tablespoon olive oil or melted butter one half teaspoon mustard the kind prepared for table one half teaspoon salt dash cayenne pepper eight rub these together thoroughly with the yolks nine make little balls of this paste the size of the yolks ten fit one ball into each pair of whites note if used for table serve with white sauce poured around them if used for picnic wrap waxed paper around each until needed it's a picnic it's a picnic it's a picnic it's a picnic cried the kitchen people yes explained mary frances that's it aunt maria is giving me a picnic to celebrate my ambition she says whatever that means anyhow father's coming he's going to make up for the lunch he couldn't come to i'm so happy so am i goody goody i'm all ready mary frances turned if it isn't basket she cried i had no idea you that i wanted to go asked basket proudly my family are the most important picnickers at any picnic we always go well to be sure exclaimed mary frances here wait these eggs will be ready in a minute tuck the napkin in carefully please said basket i won't spill them out anything else no said mary frances aunt maria said i could bring just one thing and to surprise everybody so i have not told anyone what i am going to bring i wonder if but her thought was cut short by coffee pots crying excitedly i want to go i want to go i want to go 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 i want to go 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 oh you can't go said saucepan why you you'd you you'd that will do said mary frances i'll take you coffee pot maybe aunt maria's little coffee pot won't be large enough for all the picnic eleanor and bob are going with us coffee pot looked triumphantly at saucepan but seemed too happy to say anything good-bye kitchen people said mary frances i wish i could take you all good-bye cried the kitchen people hope you'll have a lovely time i'd be scared said saucepan glancing at coffee pot who knows what's in the woods and as mary frances closed the door he was singing if polar bears were everywheres and leopards came to tea and fearful bats and gnawing gnats all came to eat with me and giant snakes ate all the cakes what a picnic that would be boo end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the mary frances cookbook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 22. The Candy Pull. Get scared at the Pickwick, I mean Picnic, coffee, tea saucepan the next morning. Nope, said Coffee Pot. The airing did me good. I feel lots clearer. Tell us about it. Oh, I'm not good at storytelling. The aunt told about the funniest recipe she knew, called maryland biscuits i think anyhow she said to beat em twenty minutes with an axe that's a kitchen person i never heard of said tea kettle did the aunt like the little miss cooking asked auntie rolling pin anxiously yes and she talked about mary frances's development of character whatever that is it seemed to have something to do with cooking for at the same time she told about the things our little miss had made and seemed so proud may i see your book my dear she asked mary frances for our little mistress had the book tucked under her arm how far are you and when mary frances showed her candy she exclaimed why to-morrow my dear she never used to call her my dear you can have a candy pull only she laughed it isn't the kind that is pulled oh aunt maria said mary frances that's the loveliest thought the candy pull i mean humph said saucepan i don't think so that means we can't help her oh no it doesn't said auntie rolling pin we can help her a great deal by just doing our part don't you see she doesn't need us as she used to 
i suppose we ought to be glad said saucepan now eleanor said mary frances that evening father and the boys aren't invited until after the candy is made where are they now do you know asked eleanor father and aunt maria are in the library and the boys are up in billy's den so we'll read the recipes over first thing and get started soon as possible do read them mary frances said eleanor i'm so anxious i'm just crazy to learn how to make them well said mary frances the first is pickaninny fudge isn't that just like mother to call chocolate fudge that cute name hurry mary frances do read it cried eleanor delighted mary frances read number twenty nine pickaninny fudge two cups sugar one cup milk two tablespoons butter four squares chocolate four ounces five drops vanilla one put sugar milk chocolate and butter together in a pan two boil until a few drops harden when dropped into cold water three butter a platter four add vanilla to candy and stir while it cools five cut into squares with a buttered knife while still soft that just makes my mouth water mary frances said eleanor if the next is as good as that it is declared mary frances listen number thirty walnut kisses one cup brown sugar one half cup granulated sugar one quarter cup cold water white one egg one boil sugars and water together until a few drops harden when dropped into cold water two beat white of egg stiff three pour the sugar syrup very slowly upon the white of egg beating all the time four butter a platter five drop by tablespoonfuls on the platter six put a half walnut on each little mound or kiss these are grand said mary frances mother made some just before she was ill but have you the walnuts asked eleanor anxiously yes explained mary frances aunt maria saw these recipes yesterday at the picnic and she brought over a lot of walnuts ready for us if she hadn't i'd never have thought of them i guess now to work you can make the walnut kisses if you like if you'll explain it all to me said eleanor of course i will said mary frances but you see mother has written out every single action just as you do it that makes it so easy see if you can do it alone try i'd love to said eleanor the little girls worked pretty quietly until they were ready to pour out the candy how are you getting along children inquired aunt maria at the door oh auntie i'm so glad you came said mary frances we were just a little afraid without help yes i see said aunt maria you might easily be burned this is perfect so far now and she showed the children how to pour out the candy almost as well as the kitchen people could thought mary frances walnut kisses said her father kissing mary frances good night are next best to real kisses which although they are made of nothing oh fudge exclaimed billy and everybody laughed End of chapter 22chapter twenty three of the mary frances cookbook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the mary frances cookbook by jane eyre fryer chapter twenty three getting ready for a party chapter twenty three how time flies mary frances tied on her new apron and put on her pretty little cap fly time is nearly gone said saucepan and school time is almost here he added seeing mary frances didn't seem to notice yes she said but before school time there's a grand good time mother comes home to-morrow Ooh, whistled tea kettle so soon well said mary frances it doesn't seem soon when i think of it without my cooking lessons but when i think i'm nearly through the book what's today's lesson asked auntie rolling pin i'm so anxious you do get through thank you auntie rolling pin i must tell you i'm going to give a tea party a tea party exclaimed teapot clapping his lid up and down oh lovely oh this is a tea party without tea said mary frances we're going to have two kinds of cake and cocoa then seeing how disappointed teapot looked oh i will have tea too 
Aunt Maria without tea? That will never do. Now for the next recipe. Number 31. Sponge cake. Two eggs, one cup sugar, one third cup boiling water, one half teaspoon vanilla or lemon extract, one cup flour, one and one half teaspoon baking powder, dash of salt. 1. Separate yolks of eggs and beat in a large bowl. 2. Add gradually half the sugar, stirring well. 3. Add the boiling water slowly. 4. Add remaining sugar and the flavoring. 5. Sift together twice, flour, baking powder, and salt. 6. Sift by small quantities into the mixture, beating well each time. 7. Beat whites of eggs and fold them into the cake. 8. Grease pan. Toss around in it one quarter cup flour. Throw out. This prevents sticking. 9. Pour in the cake. 10. Bake in a moderate oven about 35 minutes. Humph, said Auntie Rolling Pin. That's all right, but it doesn't give you much idea how the oven should be. No, explained Mary Frances. I suppose Mother intended to show me about that. Of course, child, said Auntie Rolling Pin. That was it. Now, I'll tell you all about cake. What's that? A queer muffled voice. Mary Frances started in surprise. A great commotion inside the pantry, and the sound of many little voices. Then she made out the words. Get out of my way. Here, you, step aside. Then a little shriek or two, followed by the sound of falling tins. Oh, you knock my nose. There, that makes the fiftieth dent. No wonder I look old and worn out. Can't you wait a minute? At length there came a pounding on the door and a high little voice. Or was it two voices? Let me out. Oh, I say, please let me out. Mercy, thought Mary Frances. I hope there isn't going to be any trouble. And she cautiously opened the pantry door a little way. The two cake tins pushed their way out. Oh, thank you, they said breathlessly in chorus, looking at each other all the while as though they'd learned and rehearsed every word. I thought I'd never get out to help. I've listened through the door to every lesson, just hoping my turn would come. There I was back of the other pots and pans, and when I heard cake, I just jumped. As I had just started to say, Auntie Rolling Pin began, What do you know about cakes? cried the cake tins angrily. If everybody just mind his own cooking, whoever rolls cakes? Well, I know about cookies, said Auntie Rolling Pin, and besides, I know about most things. I belong to a real cooking teacher. Prove it, cried the cake tins. I will, said Auntie Rolling Pin. Here's part of a lecture the teacher used to give. Now, ladies, you can see the exceedingly good texture of this cake as I drop it from the spoon. The nutritive value of the utilized composition is unequaled, except in rare cases of culinary economy. For instance, the protides, the carbonaceous contributions plus the condiments, afford an instance of unusual strength-giving power. The inexcusable prodigality of the American housewife, Whew, whistled Tea Kettle, for pity's sake, stop it. Humph, said Square Cake Tin, I don't see that that proves you know anything about cake. Now I'll explain. There are really only two kinds of cake in general. One, cakes without butter, or some form of sponge cakes. Two, cakes with butter, or plain cakes. More important than the mixing of the cake is the baking. Have a rather low fire, which will gradually increase in heat without adding more fuel. Rules. Thin cakes require a hotter oven than larger ones. Molasses cake will burn easily, so require a cooler oven than others. Sponge cakes require a slower oven than butter cakes. Cake is done when it shrinks from the sides of a pan or when a straw comes out dry. You know the way, don't you? Yes, said Mary Frances. My, what a lot you do know. Now, read the next recipe, please. The butter kind, said Mary Frances, whereat the cake tins look pleased. Number 32. Dream cake. Four tablespoons butter, one cup sugar, two eggs, one half cup milk, one and one quarter cups flour, two teaspoons baking powder, one eighth teaspoon ground mace, dash of salt, one teaspoon vanilla. One, 
put butter in a bowl add sugar cream or rub thoroughly together two beat yolks of eggs add to butter and sugar stirring well three mix and sift twice flour baking powder mace and salt four add one-third of the milk to the yolks butter and sugar five sift in one-third of the flour do this until all the milk and flour are used beating well each time six add vanilla beat well seven beat white of eggs light fold them into the cake eight grease shallow pan as in number thirty one pour in the cake nine bake in moderate oven about thirty five minutes or until it shrinks from the pan we'll both be used exclaimed the cake pans joyously i told you so i told you they cried at each other as though having an argument come said mary frances less talking we must get to work look at the oven first said the cake pan as mary frances started to break the eggs is it right asked the little girl lifting them up to see yes they said it will be just right when we are ready all the materials you'll need ready asked round cake tin after a minute yes looking over the table i see everything good i brought the butter into the warm room an hour ago said mary frances so that it would be softened by the time i needed it i'll make the sponge cake first as the oven will be cooler then right cried the cake tins but when you open the oven door be careful to do so gently as any jarring will break the gas bubbles very easily doing much more harm toward making the cake heavy than the air in fact if the door is opened carefully and not too soon it does no harm with the cake tins help a warm and tired but very happy little girl brought two golden brown fragrant cakes to the table one half hour before lunch time turn us on our sides panted the cake tins to let us cool off quickly and evenly my but it was warm in there how beautiful the cakes look said mary frances doing as she was told why not take a taste square cake tin asked oh it's just before lunch time said mary frances and would spoil my appetite mother doesn't allow me just one sweet mouthful tempted cake tin it seems so good i guess i will just this once and cutting a piece she ate it oh she cried my beautiful cake look it's sinking down in the middle the tears came to her eyes oh i'm so so sorry said cake tin i was too excited and proud why didn't you tell me mary frances asked that a fresh cake if cut would fall oh said cake tin i meant to be so helpful i'll try never to be too proud again end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the mary frances cookbook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the mary frances cookbook by jane eyre fryer chapter twenty four the tea party chapter twenty four the tea party mary frances didn't eat much lunch what's the matter child asked aunt maria anxiously homesick for mother or was today's lesson too hard then mary frances told of cutting and eating the fresh cake and aunt maria she said the tears flowing down her cheeks it went down 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 until i was afraid it would rise out of the bottom of the pan the other way never mind dear child aunt maria comforted her i did the same thing to my first cake i remember it well you did aunt maria yes said the old lady i'll tell you what we'll do i'll bake a cake in place of yours for tonight's party don't tell any one oh thank you aunt maria cried mary frances that's so kind not a word to any one cautioned aunt maria what else do you have cocoa said mary frances i can make that my smiled aunt maria i'm so proud after the games and riddles mary frances excused herself from her guests and made the cocoa and the pot of tea for her aunt then billy carried in the tray on which she had placed the cake and the cups and saucers plates napkins and chocolate pot and oh yes teapot for aunt maria and she poured the cocoa like a real grown-up lady while the boys passed the plates and the cake and served the guests to the cups of cocoa 
Did Mary Frances make this cake? asked one of the guests. I'm awfully glad she didn't ask about the other, thought the little girl. Yes, said Eleanor's brother Bob. Yes, knowing the greatness of the present occasion, I have written a poem, entitled Ode to the Cook, bowing to Mary Frances, which, with your kind indulgence, I will now read. Begin, laughed Mary Frances. Bob cleared his throat and began. Mary Frances is a girl who cooks for you and I. She can boil a fancy cake or stew a cherry pie. Once she made a pot of soup and served it for our dinner. We thought that we were like to die. It made us so much thinner. Time to weep, asked Billy, pathetically. Now, this our cook will save expense, for when she is your baker, you may save your doctor's bill. Just get an undertaker. Now, Billy, cried Mary Frances, what have you been telling? Oh, Bob, I say, said Billy. Mary Frances, don't mind Bob, interrupted Eleanor. You see what I have to stand all the time? And Mary Frances laughed heartily. Did you think I minded Bob, she asked. Show you forgive me, Mary Frances, begged Bob, by letting me have another cup of cake and another piece of cocoa. Not another, laughingly corrected Mary Frances. To be polite, I believe I must pretend I didn't notice you'd had any. You certainly are kind, Mary Frances, said Bob, when I don't know how many pieces. I know, cried Eleanor. This makes the fifth. Well, Nell begged Bob, don't tell Mother. You deserve it, said Eleanor. Come, said Billy. Already? Another game? Blind feeds blind? And they blindfolded the boy's eyes and set them opposite each other, each with a plate of little pieces of cake and a spoon. They were to try to feed each other. The one who dropped the least number of pieces and whose cake was first gone won. It was very funny. Sometimes the spoon was poked into the other boy's ear. Sometimes it hit his nose. Everything was grand, Mary Frances said Eleanor, and it was the loveliest party. I think so too, smiled Aunt Maria. One last riddle, said Mary Frances's father, bidding the young people good night. Why is Mary Frances the happiest girl in the world? Then they all guessed, because mother is coming home tomorrow. Oh, Mary Frances laughed Eleanor, I've had more fun. Good night, dear. And so have we all of us. And thank you, cried the others. Good night. Good night. Good night. End of chapter 24「Chapter twenty five of the Mary Frances Cookbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter twenty five. Mary Frances Gets Dinner. Oh, my dear kitchen people, I'm so happy. I don't know whether I'm myself or not. You are, solemnly declared Saucepan. I mean, you are our little miss, Miss Mary Frances. My, I feel so relieved, said Mary Frances. Since that is so, I'll tell you why I'm so excited. Mother is coming home today, and I'm going to get dinner. Isn't it lovely? Everybody, shouted Tea Kettle, ready? With that, every utensil in the kitchen sprang to its queer little feet. We're all quite ready, mistress, said Tea Kettle, trying to make a bow but looking very clumsy and ridiculous, trying at the same time to keep water from spilling out of his nose. Thank you, everybody, said Mary Frances, very gravely. However, I'll not need anyone just now but Auntie Rolling Pin. Where is she? She's out picking cherries to make a pumpkin pie, said Sauce Pan in a loud whisper to Pie Plate. Here I am, child, Auntie Rolling Pin's voice answered. I can't seem to roll out. Get out of my way, you— with that, knife, fork, and spoon slid to the side of the table, and she rolled to the edge. What is it, child? She smiled. It's the grandest thing, said Mary Frances. Number 33, Queen of Hearts Tarts. Spread cooked heart-shaped pastry shells with preserved cherries. See number 34. Tarts, chuckled Auntie Rolling Pin. Oh, my handles, I am so happy. Are the cherries ready, child? She asked anxiously. Yes, said Mary Frances. I am to use number 34, pastry, one cup flour, one quarter teaspoon salt, one third cup lard, one third cup cold water. 
use as little water as possible one sift salt and flour into a bowl two rub lard into flour with fingertips until like coarse powder three add half the cold water stirring with a knife to form a stiff ball keep this on one side of the bowl four stir in more water until the remaining flour forms a ball press these balls together five roll out fit to pie plate trim off overhanging edges six bake in a hot oven that's it exclaimed auntie rolling pin joyously i was afraid there might not be shortening or lard enough in the recipe the whole art of making good pastry is in having one-third as much lard as flour and using as little water as possible i was afraid too that your mother would not put pastry in the book for when flour or starch grains are coated in fat they are too dry to swell well in cooking and cannot burst open they are not i'm sorry to say a very digestible food i'm glad she did though said mary frances she will not often let us eat pastry but i spec she imagined how pleased i'd be i wonder why pie tastes so good if it isn't good for us my how much i have to do now i'm ready at these words middle-sized bowls sprang upon the table measuring cup dumped a cup of flour into it and ran toward the lard kettle which was standing near is the salt in the flour asked auntie rolling pin critically yes ma'am said teaspoon i put it in who'll measure the lard asked mary frances i will and measuring cup threw it into bowl well laughed mary frances and what do i do you'll do enough child said auntie rolling pin before you get ready a whole big dinner even with our help well really said mary frances i suppose i ought to explain these tarts are more specially for billy than for dinner i promised him oh that's all right said auntie rolling pin that only makes it nicer than ever now she went on rub the flour and lard together cover the lard with the flour yes that's it now rub them together until it seems like coarse powder you could use a knife instead chopping the lard all through that right asked mary frances holding some down for auntie rolling pin to look at since she couldn't see over the edge of the bowl yes that is right she answered now you may use a knife for stirring and pour just a little water in oh mercy child as mary frances was about to throw in a quarter of a glass not that way make a little well in the flour pour in about one tablespoon of water mix well let that rest at one side and do the same thing in another place and then another finally stirring all together in one big ball that's just right as mary frances lifted up the paste now sift a little flour on the board and oh how many tarts are you going to make six all right cut the paste into five even pieces and with me mary frances laughed auntie rolling pin seemed so pleased roll out each piece about one-eighth of an inch thick after cutting out save all the leftover trimmings to use for the last one plates ready all ready answered the little heart-shaped tart plates how do i make a pretty border asked mary frances cutting the trimmings from the edge of tart plate with a knife held upright along the edge fork came dancing from the edge of the table oh i remember said mary frances pressing the prongs into the outer edge of the crust they are grand chuckled auntie rolling pin can you bake them you need a very hot oven to bake them but the cherries said mary frances glad to think she had caught auntie rolling pin in an oversight not until the pastry's cooked child said auntie rolling pin with a smile mary frances slipped the little plates into the oven and made room on the table to place the dinner as she prepared it in a short fifteen minutes the tarts were ready aren't they sweet the little girl exclaimed my i wish they were thought to be very good for children what's for dinner asked tea kettle anxiously i'll tell you said mary frances i've written out the menu potato soup pan broiled steak cream cabbage mashed potatoes tomato and lettuce salad banana bread pudding with hard sauce coffee very elegant but that's a lot to do isn't it said tea kettle perhaps if you read over all the new recipes and we talk them over when it's each one's turn to commence we can work better oh thank you tea kettle said mary frances that is a very bright idea tea kettle glistened i'll read them continued mary frances 
as they come in the book. I have the lettuce well washed and the tomatoes sliced. All I have to do is dry the lettuce at dinner time, and soon I can make the number 35 salad dressing. One teaspoon salt, three quarter teaspoon mustard, one and one half tablespoons sugar, two teaspoons flour, three quarter cup sour cream or milk, one egg, one tablespoon vinegar, one teaspoon butter, a few grains of red pepper, one beat egg, two mix mustard, sugar, flour, salt, and pepper, three add eggs slowly, beating well at the same time, four add milk, beat, five cook in a saucepan placed in boiling water, six stir until it thickens like cream, remove from heat at once, seven add vinegar very slowly, beating all the while, eight stir in the butter, serve cold on lettuce or sliced tomatoes. If this is cooked too long, it will curdle, or the egg will become hard and separate, said Saucepan, but I'll be careful. Now I'm ready for work. Mary Frances laughed. Thank you, Saucepan, she said as he began to move around, going hither and thither. The next recipes are number 36, creamed new cabbage. 1. Cut in half and wash well a young green cabbage. 2. Cut out and throw away the hard stem part. 3. Make ready a kettle of boiling water. Put in cabbage, leave uncovered. 4. When the water boils, throw in 1 teaspoon salt and 1 quarter teaspoon baking soda, or bicarbonate of soda. 5. Boil gently about half an hour, or until it begins to lose its bright green color. Lift out with skimmer. 6. Pour over it white sauce just before serving. Number 37. Bread pudding. 1. Cut slices of stale bread into squares of about one half inch. 2. For two cups bread, allow one pint milk, two cups, two tablespoons sugar, two eggs, one quarter teaspoon vanilla. 3. Moisten bread with hot water. 4. Butter pudding dish. 5. Put into it the moistened bread. 6. Beat yolks of eggs, add sugar, add milk. 7. Pour this over the bread. 8. Beat whites of eggs. Add two tablespoons powdered sugar. Beat well. 9. Spread this over top of pudding. 10. Bake in moderate oven one half hour. 11. Serve with hard sauce or cream. Number 38. Banana bread pudding. Slice bananas over top of bread pudding before spreading on whites of eggs. Number 37. Serve with cream or hard sauce. Number 39. Hard sauce. Four tablespoons soft butter. 3 quarter cup powdered sugar, 1 half teaspoon vanilla, beaten white of 1 egg. 1. Make bowl and spoon hot with boiling water. 2. Cream or rub butter and sugar together, adding sugar by spoonfuls. 3. Add vanilla. 4. Beat in the white of egg. 5. Put in a cool place until needed. Yes, said baking dish, that is very nice, but if you use the yolk of the egg in the pudding, it will save it and make the pudding better. To save a yolk, all you have to do, it was little egg beater, is to drop it into a cup and pour a little cold water over the top to prevent its drying. You can use it next day if you keep it cool. It is wonderful, said Mary Frances, what you kitchen people know. If it weren't for your help, I'd be afraid to try to get this dinner. I'd have to make only one thing a day, as Mother meant me to do. All the kitchen people smiled happily. Is that the last recipe, asked Frying Pan? No, said Mary Frances. Why, who are you? I'm Frying Pan, of the Great Pan family, if you please, miss, answered he. Well, well, good friend, smiled Mary Frances, looking at her book. Your turn has come. Number 40. Pan Broiled Beefsteak. 1. Heat an empty frying pan to blue heat, or until it smokes. No greasing is necessary. 2. Put in the steak. 3. Cook half minute. 4. Turn on other side. 5. Cook about 4 minutes. 6. Turn and cook about 5 minutes longer. 7. Place on a hot platter and spread with butter. 8. Sprinkle with a little pepper and salt and 1 tablespoon finely chopped parsley. 9. Squeeze over it a little lemon juice. 10. Cover with another platter. 11. Remove top platter just before serving. Note. Mutton or lamb chops are pan-broiled in the same way. That's it, cried Frying Pan, delighted. That's as good as broiling, though it took people a long time to find it out. It is not, cried Gridiron Broiler, 
angrily clicking his wires. It is not Spider. For shame, said Mary Frances. Don't call names. He isn't calling names, answered Frying Pan. That's my other name, Frying Pan Spider. Then to Gridiron he added, Come, don't let's quarrel. You'll admit pan broiling is very nearly as good for chops as broiling over the coals in a broiler, and quite as good for steaks, nearly. I was just getting ready to say, said Gridiron, you didn't mean quite. It's time to commence, loudly struck in mantel clock. And then Mary Frances looked on in amazement. In walked basket with the potatoes for the potato soup. Up sprang knife ready to pare them. Over ran boiler pan with some water. Why, why, exclaimed Mary Frances, why, yes, said Tea Kettle, we'll do everything in the recipes you've already made. All you need to do is make the new recipes with our help, which Mary Frances did. Whenever she'd make a mistake, some one of the kitchen people would correct and help her. At six o'clock, all the dinner was ready to serve and the table was set. Oh, thank you, dear kitchen people, said the beaming little girl. This is the happiest time of my life. End of chapter 25。Chapter 26 of The Mary Frances Cookbook。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer. Chapter 26 mother's surprise after one last look mary frances hearing the sound of carriage wheels ran to answer the door before the bell rang but billy was there too and they opened the door together oh mother cried mary frances you dear darling mother what a cry baby i am as the tears rolled down her cheeks and mother kissed her and billy and father again and again what a cry baby which she is not declared billy tell mother mary frances i can't wait for you to tell your secret a secret smiled mother a secret mary frances oh how good something smells said mother it makes me hungry come right out then said mary frances bowing dinner is served here asked her mother i imagined we'd go over to aunt maria's no mother dear laughed mary frances happily it's the surprise for you and they went into the dining room what what why how did this happen asked mother where did this feast come from everybody laughed and talked at the same time mary frances is guilty laughed billy and mary frances owned up mother said she bringing her worn and somewhat soiled little cookbook and putting it in her mother's lap i've made everything i've gone all through my book i got dinner tonight that's your surprise my own dear lovely child said mother you dear precious baby woman and taking mary frances in her lap she hugged and kissed her again and again i'm awfully sorry i couldn't exactly explain about you you dear kitchen people whispered mary frances going out to bid them good night if it hadn't been for you i never never could have done it my dear dear friends you'll not need us soon again said tea kettle sadly we're sorry yet we're glad that your mother will take our place as teacher now will you help me when i do need you asked mary frances when you do they promised and she threw them a kiss good night little miss they cried and when she turned round again they looked just like any ordinary kitchen utensils for a minute she felt very lonely then remembering she said gladly but they promised end of chapter twenty six End of The Mary Frances Cookbook by Jane Eyre Fryer